just before I uh, call on you, Ms Orr, to uh, make submissions, I should indicate to those who have leave to appear uh, the course I propose uh, about submissions in response. And the general structure of what I propose has two parts. Uh, first, parties to particular case studies should make written submissions not exceeding 20 pages about the findings which they submit should be made as arising from those case studies. Uh, those submissions will be due uh, by 4 p.m. on Friday 4 May. Now, my, int my intention is that the page limit should apply uh, in respect of each case study, so 20 pages per case study, but there is evident advantage uh, if there can be aggregation and abbreviation uh, by those who are engaged in more than the one case study. But the base rule is 20 pages per case study for the parties to that case study. The second part of it is that all parties having leave to appear in this round of the hearings will have until 4 p.m. on Monday the 7th to make written submissions about the more general issues which are identified by council in the, uh, assisting in the course of closing submissions. Some of those issues, I think, are likely to be large and quite complex. And I'm concerned, therefore, that the parties having leave to appear should have a full opportunity to develop their submissions properly, and yet, at the same time, uh, encouraging parties to distill their arguments and to express them concisely and precisely. Now, to that end, I'm minded to fix uh, an initial page limit of 35 pages in respect of these general issues. If a party seeks to submit that it can't deal with the issues fully with that page limit, then that party may and should apply for an extension of the permitted length of submission. But I do ask that the basis for that application be explained and supported in detail. Uh, putting it bluntly, it won't be enough just to say, I want more. Uh, I'll need to be persuaded about why you need more. And just for the avoidance of doubt, I should also remind parties that there are some statements that have been tendered in evidence uh, in the course of this round of hearings that have been tendered without challenge. Uh, those statements are part of the material to be uh, considered in respect of both the particular case studies and the more general issues. Uh, uh, don't uh, forget about them simply because they have not been the subject of uh, oral uh, examination in the course of hearings. Now, that's the course uh, that uh, I propose. I thought I should announce it now so that uh, parties who are represented in the hearing room can listen to the uh, closing submissions bearing in mind uh, what is uh, proposed as the uh, uh, regime that will govern their responses. Ms Orr. Ms Orr. Commissioner, over the last two weeks, the Commission has heard evidence of misconduct and of conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of financial advice by employees and employees and authorised representatives of financial services entities. This conduct has occurred in the context of fees being charged for no service, platform fees, inappropriate advice, improper conduct and the disciplinary regime. In this closing address, we will deal with each of the case studies that has been the subject of evidence in turn. 
For each case study, we will identify the findings that council assisting regard as being open on the evidence, which we will invite the entity involved in the case study to respond to in written submissions. The findings will be articulated by reference to the Commission's terms of reference. For each case study and in connection with certain other topics that have arisen in these hearings, we will also identify more general questions that arise and any party with leave to appear, as you have indicated, Commissioner, uh, will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing these questions. The first topic that was examined in these hearings was fees for no service. The first case study concerned the charging of fees for no service by AMP. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Anthony Regan, the Group Executive of Advice and New Zealand of AMP Limited, and the senior executive within the AMP group responsible for the management of AMP's advice business. The Commission heard evidence that wholly owned subsidiaries of AMP, being AMP Financial Planning, Hill Ross Financial Services, Charter Financial Planning and IPAC Securities, all holders of Australian Financial Services licences, charged fees to clients in circumstances where they did not and could not provide services to the clients for those fees. This conduct arose because of the buyer of last resort policy, or the BOLA policy, which forms part of the contractual arrangements between, for example, AMP, AMP Financial Planning and its authorised representatives. In general terms, the 2012 version of the BOLA policy enabled an authorised representative to sell a book of clients to another authorised representative and subject to certain conditions being satisfied, allowed AMP to buy the book of clients in circumstances where the authorised representative was unable to sell it to another authorised representative. The Bowler policy typically valued the book of clients on the basis of a four times multiple <coughs> of ongoing revenue from the clients. The revenue subject to this four times multiplier included advice fees that were automatically deducted from the client's products in the 12 months preceding the valuation. When it came time for AMP to sell the book of clients that it had purchased, AMP would make a loss on the sale if the ongoing fee agreement with the client was terminated. This was because in those circumstances, AMP would not be able to realise the capitalised value of those ongoing fees. It was therefore in the financial interests of the AMP advice licensees and AMP to continue the ongoing fee arrangement with the client after the client was purchased by AMP. Generally, if a client was on a register acquired by AMP under the BOLA policy, the client was moved into what was known as the BOLA pool. The Commission heard evidence of a practice of AMP to place clients into the BOLA pool and not dial down the fees being charged to those clients. In other words, AMP would intentionally keep the ongoing service fee arrangement on foot. Mr Regan's evidence was that very recently AMP had no capacity to provide services to clients who were in the bowler pool. In addition, even when AMP intended to dial down fees for clients who were in the bowler pool, it did not have adequate systems in place to ensure, place to ensure that this occurred. The first time that AMP identified to ASIC that it had systematically failed to dial down ongoing service fees for clients in the bowler pool was in a report made to ASIC under section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act on 15 January 2009. That breach report identified that the breach had occurred in September 2007 and that AMP Financial Planning first became aware of the breach in September 2008. However, AMP's conduct in transferring clients into the bowler pool and providing services continued at AMP 
after the conduct was reported to ASIC on this date. Internal AMP documents from 2013 and earlier suggest that over time a general rule developed where fees would be left on for clients for up to 90 days after the clients had been moved into the bowler pool. In January 2014, following the implementation of changes to the law after the introduction of the FOFA reforms, a business rule referred to as the 90-day exception was developed. Mr Regan referred to the 90-day exception as an exception to the bowler policy granted by the managing director of the AMP advice licensee. However, the nature of the 90-day exception may have changed over time, as internal AMP documents created post-January 2014 appear to describe it in different ways. It is unclear the extent to which, after January 2014, AMP continued to apply a general rule, rather than the 90-day exception in the way Mr Regan described it, that fees could be left on for up to 90 days. In any event, AMP Financial Planning did not notify ASIC until 17 October 2016 of this deliberate decision by application of the 90-day exception to charge clients in the bowler pool fees for services it knew it would not and could not provide. The 90-day exception business rule appears to have ceased in November 2016. However, there was a further business rule by which AMP made deliberate decisions to charge clients fees for the provision of no service. This was known as ring fencing. This rule appears to have developed after January 2014. Ring fencing occurred where, for some books of clients purchased by AMP, AMP would make the decision to ring fence the clients, <coughs> meaning that they would not be placed into the bowler pool and the register would be kept separate for later sale as a whole. The ring fenced clients would continue to pay fees without receiving any services whilst they were held separate from the bowler pool. It is unclear whether there was any 90-day limit on the period over which clients would continue to pay fees. It appears that, from at least June 2015, joint approval of both the managing director of the relevant AMP licensee and the head of licensee value management was required for ring fencing a book of clients. AMP did not report its ring fencing conduct to ASIC until the 3rd of May 2017, though at that time AMP did not describe the conduct as a business practice. It is not clear when the ring fencing practice ceased. Mr Regan's evidence was that it ceased in November 2016. However, an email referred to in the Clayton Utes report, to which we will come, shows that the managing director of AMP Financial Planning approved a ring fencing exception on the 18th of January 2017. By the ring fencing conduct and the various permutations of the 90-day exception, AMP decided to continue to charge ongoing service fees to customers in circumstances where it would not be providing and could not be providing services for those fees. In addition, when AMP charged fees for services to clients in the bowler pool due to a failure to have adequate systems in place to dial down fees, AMP accepted payment for financial services that it had no reasonable grounds to believe it would supply to the clients. Mr Regan accepted that there was no lawful basis for the 90-day exception or the ring fencing business rules. He accepted that it was obvious that charging clients fees for services that are intentionally and knowingly not being provided was both unlawful and ethically and morally wrong. Mr Regan also accepted that unless there was a customer complaint, 
the only way AMP could detect that advisers were not providing services in exchange for fees was through audits, which AMP did not consistently and regularly undertake. Mr Regan could not offer any details of work undertaken by AMP to address issues with AMP's risk management systems identified by PwC in an external audit conducted on the 30th of March 2015. Mr Regan was also asked whether it was appropriate for planners to continue to take grandfathered commissions in respect of their clients. Mr Regan said that his preference would be for fee arrangements. Mr Regan's view was that a fee arrangement rather than a commission arrangement was much more consistent with a professional environment. In its submissions to the Commission on the 13th of February 2018, AMP acknowledged that it had engaged in fees for no service conduct from 1 January 2013, which in its words involved possible contraventions of sections 180, 912 capital A, 1A, 952 capital E, 961 capital B, 961 capital K, 962 capital P, 1041 capital H and 1308 of the Corporations Act, as well as provisions of the ASIC Act, sections 12CA, 12CB, 12DA, 12DB, 12DF and 12DI. Since the 15 January 2009 breach report made to ASIC, AMP has issued five separate breach reports pursuant to section 912D of the Corporations Act to ASIC, notifying it of breaches of section 912 capital A 1A in relation to the charging of fees for no service. One was on 27 May 2015, another on 5 December 2016, two on 3 May 2017 and one on 8 June 2017. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the charging of fees for no service by AMP and its advice licensees might have amounted to misconduct. AMP acknowledged as much in its initial submissions and in evidence to the Commission. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the AMP advice licensees may have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, by contravening their statutory obligation <coughs> under section 912 capital A 1A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure the financial services covered by their licence are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. The relevant conduct is the application of the 90-day exception to clients in the bowler pool or ring fencing of clients, knowing that they would be continued to be charged fee for services with which they would not and could not be provided, and the failure to have adequate systems to turn off <coughs> ongoing fees for all clients in the bowler pool. AMP acknowledged uh, these breaches in the five breach reports it issued to ASIC under section 912D of the Corporations Act. <coughs> Second, by contravening their statutory obligations under section 912 capital A 1CA of the Corporations Act, by failing to take reasonable steps to ensure that their representatives would act in accordance with the norm of conduct prescribed by section 12 DI 1 and 3 of the ASIC Act. At the time of payment of fees by clients subject to the 90-day exception or ring fencing, authorised representatives of the AMP advice licensees <clears throat> did not intend to supply services. There were also reasonable grounds for believing that the AMP advice, advice licensees would not or would not be able to supply financial services within at least 90 days 
in respect of the 90-day exception and for an indeterminate amount of time in respect of ring, ring fencing and the practice adopted post-2009. Third, <coughs> separate from the buying of books of clients from advisers, by contravening their statutory obligation under section 912 capital A 1H by not having adequate risk management systems in place. As Mr Regan admitted, the only real way in which AMP was able to detect individual advisers charging for services that they did not provide was through audits, which AMP did not consistently and regularly undertake. Fourth, by contravening their statutory obligation under section 912D1B of the Corporations Act to report as soon as practicable and in any event within 10 business days, a breach or likely breach of their obligations under sections 912 capital A 1A, CA and H of the Corporations <coughs> Act. At least some of the AMP advice licensees had been aware of the charging of fees for no service to clients in the bowler pool since 2009. In respect of the formal 90-day exception, the AMP advice licensees had been aware of this conduct since January 2014. And despite lodging a report with ASIC about the conduct on 27 May 2015, the AMP advice licensees did not <coughs> notify ASIC of the extent and nature of the conduct until the 26th of November 2016. In respect of the ring fencing conduct, the AMP advice licensees had been aware of the conduct since May 2015 and did not notify ASIC until May 2017. Fifth, by engaging in conduct that was, in all of the circumstances, unconscionable in connection with the possible supply of financial services, contrary to section 12CB of the ASIC Act. Sixth, by contravening their statutory obligation under section 912A1C of the Corporations Act to comply with the financial services laws, namely the laws in 912A1A, CA and H, and 912D of the Corporations Act, as well as sections 12CB and 12DI of the ASIC Act. Seventh, by contravening sections 12DI1 and 3 of the ASIC Act in relation to the acceptance of payment from clients subject to the 90-day exception and ring fencing, and section 12DI3 of the ASIC Act in relation to acceptance of payments for advice services from any client in the bowler pool. AMP acknowledged so much uh, in relation to section 12DI3 in the five breach reports that it issued to ASIC under section 912D of the Corporations Act. It is open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct was attributable, at least in part, to the culture and governance practices within AMP. The evidence of Mr Regan demonstrated that senior management and employees of AMP advice licensees were aware that the conduct was a breach of their financial services licenses, licenses, but continued to engage in the conduct. It also showed that despite attempts from more junior staff to convince senior management of AMP advice licensees to cease charging fees for no service, they continued to do so. Mr Regan admitted that this conduct showed that the culture at AMP was not as robust as it should be. He agreed that it showed a culture in which conscious decisions were made to protect the profitability of AMP and put the interests of shareholders first at the expense both of the interests of clients and of complying with the law. A question raised by the approach of AMP is this. Why has it placed such emphasis on the question of whether an employee or executive received legal advice explaining that it was unlawful to charge for fees for no service? 
While the receipt of such advice might be an aggravating factor in the culpability of an individual, it is difficult to understand why so many employees and executives at AMP were unable to recognise something that was plain to Mr Regan, namely that to services that will not and cannot be provided is unlawful and ethically and morally wrong. The receipt of payment compliance without the necessity to provide any accompanying service has been, we observe, and continues to be fundamental to the financial advice industry through the commission system. In reliance upon grandfathering arrangements, a substantial proportion of AMP's income in connection with its clients continues to come from commissions. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct was attributable to poor risk management practices at AMP. As Mr Regan conceded, the audit process was the only real way for failures by authorised representatives to provide ongoing services to be detected. By delaying in adopting PwC's recommendations about the audit system, AMP continued to allow its risk management practices to be deficient in detecting this type of conduct. The evidence also establishes that over a two-year period between 27 May 2015 and 3 May 2017, AMP and the AMP licensees made 20 false or misleading statements or representations in 12 communications to ASIC about the extent and nature of its ongoing service fee conduct. In its initial submissions to the Commission, AMP admitted that it engaged in possible misconduct in relation to the extent and nature of its reporting to ASIC in relation to this conduct. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that AMP's communications with ASIC might have amounted to misconduct on the basis that it may have contravened sections 1308, 2 and 3 of the Corporations Act. And in respect of the breach reports that were lodged with ASIC on 25 May 2017 and 3 May 2017, which contained four of the 20 misleading statements. Sorry, what dates, Ms Orr? The 3rd and 25th of May 2017, yes. containing four of the 20 misleading statements. Um, it may have contravened sections um, 13084 and 5 of the Corporations Act. It is open to the Commissioner to find that those false or misleading statements were material because they would be likely to affect and appear intended to affect the manner in which ASIC went about investigating the conduct and the approach of AMP to the appropriate method of compensation for the victims of the conduct. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that AMP's conduct in misleading ASIC fell below community standards and expectations. <coughs> Through AMP's dealings with ASIC regarding the extent and nature of its fee-for-no-service conduct, AMP adopted an attitude toward the regulator that was not forthright or honest and demonstrated a deliberate attempt to mislead. It is open to the Commissioner to find that AMP's conduct in misleading ASIC was attributable to the culture and governance practices of AMP. The senior management and executives who contributed to the misleading of ASIC over the two-year period had knowledge of the extent and nature of the conduct and were conduct and were by junior staff about it being a breach, but continued with a misleading narrative to ASIC. The evidence also established that on 16 October 2017, when AMP met with ASIC, and presented the report from Clayton Utes and its letter of instructions to Clayton Utes, AMP may have misled ASIC as to the character of the Clayton Utes report. The letter of instructions appointed and instructed Clayton Utes 
to undertake an external and independent investigation into the Bowler matters, which investigation was said in the letter to be entirely independent of the business and commissioned exclusively by the board through the chair and the CEO. The letter of instructions also stated that at the conclusion of the investigation, Clayton Newts would provide to the AMP board the final report which set out its findings and advice in accordance with the terms of reference provided to Clayton Newts. <coughs> the report also itself stated that Clayton Newts had been retained to conduct an external and independent investigation. It follows that in producing the Clayton Newts report and the letter of instructions to ASIC under a section 33 notice on the 16th of October 2017, AMP represented to ASIC that this report was external and independent. On the 14th of November 2017, Mr Salter, the General Counsel of AMP, wrote to ASIC in a letter that we have tendered today and stated that we are committed to having an open and transparent relationship with ASIC and that it was in this vein that AMP had produced to ASIC a copy of the Clayton Newts report. The evidence suggests that the description of Clayton Newts's work as being external and independent may be at least inaccurate, if not misleading. We note the following matters. Clayton Newts provided AMP with 25 drafts of the report and AMP provided comments on the drafts. AMP and Clayton Newts participated in at least two phone calls, one on the 21st of September 2017 and the other post the 25th of September 2017 uh, about the contents of the draft report. Employees and officers of AMP, including Mr Regan, <coughs> Ms Brenner, the chair of AMP, Mr Bella, I'm sorry, Mr Meller, the CEO of AMP, and particularly Mr Salter, either marked up or suggested amendments to the draft report. The effect of some of those markups or suggestions by Mr Salter appears on their face to be to limit the findings as to the extent of the knowledge and involvement of the most senior executives of AMP in the impugned ongoing service fee conduct. Following the phone call on the 21st of September 2017, Mr Meller's name was removed from the draft report as a person involved in either the bowler decision making or the internal process to report to ASIC following the 2015 breach report. In an email, Clayton Utes explained that a reason for removing his name was that it would attract unnecessary attention to him by ASIC. Clayton Newts also explained that it found that Mr Meller was not aware of the 90-day exceptional ring fencing and he was not involved in the communications with ASIC after the breach report on 27 May 2015, so instead included this in the summary of the legal advice. Mr Salter sought, on more than one occasion, to alter the language used by Clayton Utes as to Clayton Utes's findings with respect to the knowledge by Mr Caprioli of internal legal advices that advised that the conduct was illegal and had to cease. Mr Salter was successful in doing so. <coughs> After the final report was delivered by Clayton Utes on the 6th of October 2017, Ms Brenner requested that a statement be incorporated into the copy of the report to be handed to ASIC on Monday to the effect that Mr Meller was unaware of the bowler practices or their illegality. In the final report, dated the 16th of October 2017, a new paragraph was included that explained that Mr Meller confirmed to Clayton Utes that he was not aware of the 90-day exception and ring fencing and that he did not receive nor was he aware of any of the legal advices and that Clayton Utes had come to the same conclusion. 
That paragraph did not appear in the report until the 15th of October 2017 and was in a different form to the finding originally proposed by Clayton Utes. Mr Salter then amended the language of the proposed finding so that Clayton Utes instead expressed the positive conclusion that it had come to the conclusion that Mr Meller was unaware of the 90-day exception. The Board of AMP may have approved the changes to the Clayton Utes report before it was submitted to ASIC. Mr Regan's evidence was that the report was substantially settled by the Board and General Counsel and Clayton Utes in the weeks leading up to the ultimate final report on the 16th of October 2017. The minutes of the AMP board meeting held on the 16th of October 2017, which we have tended today, record the board having considered the proposed amendments to the report. Clayton Utes then finalised and issued the report. AMP did not refer to any of this conduct in its submissions to the Commission. In the course of giving evidence, Mr Regan conceded that he felt a level of discomfort with the fact that AMP had met with ASIC and represented to it that the Clayton Utes report was an external and independent report. On this evidence, to the Commissioner to find that the conduct in connection with the Clayton Utes report might have amounted to misconduct <coughs> by contravening sections 13082 and 3 of the Corporations Act and section 60 of the ASIC Act. Having regard to changes made to the report, there is a reasonable basis for concluding that AMP, by one or more of its senior employees or officers, knew that the representation that the report and the findings made within it were entirely findings made findings made within it were entirely independent was materially incorrect again such a representation is material as it's likely to affect and appears intended to affect the manner in which ASIC went about investigating the conduct as well as the relationship between ASIC and AMP it is open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct by AMP in its further dealings with the regulator and its mischaracterisation of the nature of the Clayton Utes report was also attributable to and governance practices within AMP. It is open to the Commissioner to find that it reflects an absence of a compliance culture and a persistent and prevalent attitude at a very senior level within AMP that it is acceptable to deal with ASIC other than frankly and candidly. AMP is in invited to provide written submission submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as open, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. Before I move to the second case study in relation to fees for no service, uh, Mr Costello um, informs me that one of the dates uh, that I um, gave you, Commissioner, in response to your question at transcript 1931, line 25, should have been 27 May 2015, not 25 May 2017. Thank you. The second case study uh, concerned the charging of fees for no service by CBA. <coughs> One witness gave evidence in this case study, <coughs> Ms Marianne Perkovic, the Executive General Manager and Director of Commonwealth Private Limited. Ms Perkovic previously had overall responsibility for each of CBA's financial services licence holding subsidiaries, being Commonwealth Financial Planning, Financial Wisdom, Count Financial and BW Financial Advice. Ms Perkovic gave evidence that CBA had paid out or offered an $18.5 million of refunds, including interest, to customers who had been charged fees for no service by CFPL, Count and BW Financial Advice. The clients who were charged fees for no service by CBA entities fell into two categories. 
The first category was clients who were allocated to a financial planner in circumstances where the financial planner failed to provide ongoing services to the client and the relevant entity had no systems in place to ensure the services were delivered. These clients were charged fees for no service by CFPL and BW Financial Advice. Count has not acknowledged a systemic problem with the charging of fees to this first category of clients. However, the Commission heard evidence about a number of Count advisors identified in one Count Risk and Compliance Forum who were not providing services in exchange for the fees they were charging. Ms Perkovic said that ASIC had requested in 2014 that CBA undertake sample testing in relation to both Count and another CBA licensee, Financial Wisdom. Work in response to this request was ongoing, but Ms Perkovic said that she understood the fail rates for both licensees to be less than 2%. The second category of clients who were charged fees for no service were orphaned clients. Orphaned clients were no longer allocated to a planner and there was therefore no possibility that advice would be provided to them. CFPL, BW Financial Advice and Count each charged this category of clients fees without providing services. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of the CBA advice licensees, CFPL, BW Financial Advice and Count might amount to misconduct. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that each of these entities may have contravened their statutory obligation under section 912A1A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure the financial services covered by their licence are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Each of these entities may also have contravened their statutory obligation under section 912A1D of the Corporations Act to have available adequate resources, including technological resources, to provide the financial services covered by the licence and to carry out supervisory arrangements. In respect of orphan clients, each of these entities may have contravened their statutory obligation under section 12DI3 of the ASIC Act to not accept payment or other consideration for financial services if at the time of accepting the payment there were reasonable grounds for believing that they will not be able to supply the financial services within the period specified by the person. The evidence also established that each of CFPL, BW Financial Advice and Count gave notice pursuant to section 912D of the Corporations Act to ASIC of their respective possible breaches in relation to fees for no service conduct in the second half of 2014. The first documented instance of a CFPL client paying for but not receiving service arose from a customer complaint in July 2008. CFPL received complaints in each of the years from 2008 to 2013 about fees being charged but no services being provided. In April 2012, high level analysis was conducted with a view to determining if there were any ongoing service fee issues within the CBA advice business, including CFPL. That analysis identified 257 clients who were paying ongoing service fees but were not attached to a planner. Various systemic failings were identified, including that there was no supervision or monitoring to identify whether ongoing service obligations were being met by planners. There were CFPL clients who were not assigned to an active advisor. There was no single source of data by which the status of ongoing service fee clients could be identified. Financial planners were not required to maintain a register of their ongoing service clients and the position of ongoing service fee clients could only be ascertained by manual searches across a number of systems. 
From at least May 2012, a number of senior people within the CBA advice business, including the group executive, were aware of these issues. The possible exposure arising from the issues was estimated at this time as $6 million. Count was also asked to consider whether it could have similar issues. In May 2012, it was identified that Count had an orphan client list that earned fee income of between $1.5 and $2 million per annum, and that the clients on this list did not receive any type of review. In June 2012, Deloitte issued a report that found that a potential issue for CFPL was that systems to identify clients that have signed up to or receive ongoing service arrangements are, in, are inadequate. Deloitte issued a further report in July 2012. Deloitte concluded that clients in ongoing service programs were at risk of not receiving contracted services and controls had not been designed to ensure the provision of ongoing reviews. Deloitte identified over $700,000 in ongoing service fees being charged on an annual basis to over 1,050 clients allocated in the system to over 50 inactive planners. The risk of ineffective provision of ongoing service was rated by Deloitte as very high. Ms Perkovic <coughs> agreed that at the time of this report, CBA did not know whether services were being provided or not. She agreed that CFPL did not have effective controls in place to prevent ongoing service fees being charged inappropriately. CFPL did not have effective controls in place to assess whether clients were receiving the services for which they were being charged. CFPL did not know what advice was being given to clients who were paying for ongoing advice. CFPL did not have controls in place to ensure when an advisor left, the advisor's clients were moved to a new advisor. CFPL did not have controls in place to stop fees being charged to clients who became <coughs> orphaned. CFPL did not have controls in place to ascertain if clients were being notified of significant offence that may require action to be taken to protect their position and CFPL used ad hoc systems to store data that could not be centrally checked other than by manual processes. To provide a report in relation to count. Deloitte issued a draft report on 20 November 2012, which noted that as at the 5th of September 2012, count had an orphan client book which held approximately 10,200 policies. CFPL first notified ASIC of a suspected <coughs> breach on 11 July 2014. That was not a formal notification pursuant to section 912D of the Corporations Act, but an early warning. CFPL advised that it had identified 5,838 customers who had paid ongoing service fees amounting to $12.9 million in revenue and was investigating the circumstances of each customer. CFPL then made a formal notification to ASIC pursuant to section 912D in August 2014. However, on the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that senior management of CBA, CFPL and COUNT had been aware for at least 18 months before the breach notices were given of the likelihood that ongoing services were not being provided to customers who were being charged ongoing service fees. It is therefore open to find that each of CFPL and COUNT may have contravened their statutory obligations under section 912D1B of the Corporations Act to report as soon as practicable and in any event within 10 business days of becoming aware of the breach or likely breach of its obligations under section 912A. It is open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct, 
was attributable to the remuneration practices of CFPL and its advice licensees. Ms Perkovic accepted that CFPL's remuneration and performance targets were not aligned so as to ensure delivery of service. It was only in 2015 that CFPL changed its remuneration policy to align remuneration and performance targets to ensure delivery of service. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct in question was attributable to a cultural tolerance on the part of CBA and its advice licensees of risks and conduct that were potentially detrimental to clients, but which were to the financial advantage of CBA through its advice licensees. This cultural tolerance is highlighted by several aspects of Ms Perkovic's evidence. Ms Perkovic agreed that CFPL's response to the introduction of the FOFA reforms reflected an attitude that unless it was required by law to provide fee disclosure statements, CFPL would not do so. CFPL continues to receive grandfathered commissions from clients who entered into commission arrangements before the 1st of July 2013. Ms Perkovic said that CFPL has given no consideration to dialing down those commissions to zero. Her explanation was that grandfathering arrangements allow us some relief. Whilst Ms Perkovic said that CFPL was considering applying opt-in requirements to pre-1 July 2013 clients, <coughs> that CFPL has been considering that possibility for six months and has not made a decision. The evidence also suggests that CBA has taken an approach to grandfathering arrangements, which is that, at least for arrangements made between fund managers and CBA platforms pre the 1st of July 2013, the commissions provided for under those arrangements extend to clients of CBA advice licensees that have first become clients after 1 July 2013. Finally, the evidence suggests that in recent years, CBL acted to lessen rather than increase the prospects of clients receiving meaningful services. In the period from 2008 to 2017, the number of financial planners employed by CFPL fell by approximately 20, approximately 25 per cent, but the number of clients increased by almost 100 per cent. The service packages offered by CFPL were also recast. 2013, the critical element of the legacy ongoing service package was an annual review. The equivalent package now offered by CFPL, and indeed the only package now offered by CFPL, the local ongoing service package, provides for an offer of an annual review rather than an annual review. These matters suggest a culture at CBA, or at least, or at, least at CFPL, of taking an approach to clients that maximises revenue streams rather than one which focuses upon providing meaningful professional service. It is open to the Commissioner to find that a reason for CBA's failure to give timely notice of a breach to ASIC may be a consequence of the manner in which CBA's practice for considering whether to notify a breach takes into account the size of CBA's advice licensees. Ms Perkovic explained that determining the number of clients affected was important to determining the significance of the breach. Each of the CBA advice licensees have many, cli have many clients, exponentially more than the number of clients that a small independent operator would have. In the case of an authorised representative of count, the evidence suggests that if that authorised representative is consistently failing to provide service to ongoing service clients, then that might be a significant failure at the level of the individual authorised representative, but would not be treated under CBA's governance practice 
as a significant breach at the level of count. Therefore, the size of CBA may reduce the likelihood that ASIC receives timely notice under section 912D of risks to members of the public who are dealing with CBA or its subsidiary licensees. It is open to the Commissioner to find that internal systems of CFPL were inadequate to ensure the provision of services for which fees were charged and to report contravening <coughs> conduct. Ms Perkovic sought to explain the failure to give earlier notification of significant breaches as being due to a known problem that some licensees had no systems to identify whether services had been delivered, with the consequence that CBA could not know for how many clients its licensees had failed to deliver ongoing services. Ms Perkovic gave evidence that CFPL did not have systems to supervise and monitor the effective provisioning of ongoing service and accepted that CBA systems were so inadequate that it had no idea what was going on in its business. As Ms Perkovic agreed, as at 2012, the only system that CFPL had in place that was effective was a system for charging clients. CBA is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as open, as well as any other findings it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise from the two case studies in relation to fees for no service. Do clients receive any meaningful benefit from ongoing service arrangements? To what extent does the continued legislative condoning of grandfathered commissions shape and influence the culture and attitudes of financial advice licensees so as to create a disconnect between community expectations as to the charging of fees and the toll of licensees for the charging of fees for no or little service? And thirdly, should grandfathered commissions cease? The second topic that was examined in these hearings was platform fees. This topic was examined through two entities, AMP and CBA. We will address each entity separately and then consider the common questions to which all parties given leave to appear will be invited to respond. First, as to AMP, the Commission heard evidence from Mr John Keating, head of the platform products team at AMP. <coughs> Mr Keating's evidence raised three key issues. First, the absence of any controls in AMP's platforms to prevent advice fees being automatically deducted unless the client has opted to continue to pay ongoing advice fees. Financial advisers have been required since 2013 give renewal notice to give renewal notice to their clients every two years and to only continue to charge fees to a client who has opted in, in writing, to continue the ongoing fee arrangement. Mr Keating's evidence was that AMP platforms automatically deduct advice fees from the cash balance in clients' accounts and remit those fees to the relevant licensee or authorised representative. Where the cash balance of a client is insufficient to meet the fees, the platform will liquidate sufficient of the client's non-cash investments to meet the fees. The subsidiaries of AMP that operate AMP's platforms have not taken any steps to develop the technological capacity for the AMP platforms to ensure that fees are only being automatically deducted and remitted to the advice licensee if the customer has opted to continue to pay the fees. Mr Keating conceded that it was possible for AMP to implement such controls in its platforms. He could not give any reason as to why AMP had not developed the technology to ensure that this could occur. 
To Mr Keating's knowledge, this was not something that AMP had considered. The second issue raised by Mr Keating's evidence is that as at 2015, AMP knew there were AMP clients who had been placed in two particular platforms and who were being charged uncompetitive fees for the platform. AMP's own benchmarking rated these products as red compared to competitor products in the market. Since late 2016, those uncompetitive platforms have been placed on hold by AMP and can no longer receive new investors. Nevertheless, there are AMP clients who remain invested in those platforms, and AMP knows this. However, the AMP subsidiary that operates these platforms has taken no step to either make the platforms cost competitive or put in features that would enable those customers to be customers to be smoothly transitioned to a cost competitive platform. Instead, the decision was made to just leave them as they were. Similarly, the AMP advice licensees have taken no steps to obtain information from the AMP subsidiary that operates the platforms about the clients that remain invested in these uncompetitive platforms or the AMP advisors that are supposed to be looking after those clients' best interests. Mr Keating acknowledged that as at 2017, there were still 1,286 customers of AMP affiliated advisors who were invested in Wealthview, one of those two uncompetitive platforms. Of the 10,500 customers who were still invested in Portfolio Care, the other of the uncompetitive platforms, 90% of those customers were clients of AMP affiliated advisors. Mr Keating said all of those clients of affiliated advisors in the Wealthview platform were AMP financial planning clients and most of the clients of affiliated advisors in the portfolio care platform were Hill Ross clients. <coughs> At no time has either AMP financial planning or Hill Ross sought from Mr Keating the names of the financial planners who continue to have clients invested through Wealthview or Portfolio Care, respectively. AMP has not produced any further benchmarking guides since 2016. Mr Keating conceded that as a result, he was not aware of whether the competitiveness of AMP platform products has improved or worsened. The third issue raised by Mr Keating's evidence is that there are arrangements operating between AMP's platform operator, NMMT Limited, and certain funds managers, which came into existence pre-1 July 2013, under which a fee, calculated by reference to a percentage of the total value of the funds invested in the fund by AMP, was paid to NMMT by the funds manager. Mr Keating's evidence was that no fees were charged in respect of new investment funds added to the platform after the 1st of July 2013. <coughs> Mr Keating did not think that fees were payable by the funds managers in respect of new clients that invested after 1 July 2013. Mr Keating could not explain what benefit the funds managers derived by paying this commission to NMMT. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that at least each of AMP Financial Planning and Hill Ross, two AMP advice licensees, engaged in conduct that might have amounted to misconduct in the following ways. First, the AMP advice licensees may have contravened their statutory obligation under section 912A1A to do all things necessary to ensure the financial services covered by their licence are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. This arises from the failure to act in an efficient manner in identifying clients who remain in the two uncompetitive platforms so as to advise them of the position with respect to those forms 
and to, if necessary, facilitate any changes those clients may require as a result of becoming aware of that position. It also arises from the failure to act in an efficient manner in ascertaining whether wealth view or portfolio care remain uncompetitive or indeed have become even more uncompetitive. And it arises from a failure to identify for audit financial advisors who are likely to be at risk of failing to provide advice in the best interests of the client, given that the advisors have clients who are still invested in AMP platforms known to be uncompetitive. Second, the AMP advice licensees may have contravened section 912A 1AA of the Corporations Act by failing to have in place adequate arrangements to manage the conflicts of interest that arise from the recommending of AMP platforms by AMP authorised representatives. It is open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of AMP, the two licensees and AMP's platform operator, NMMT, is also below the standards expected by the community. NMMT has no technological systems to ensure it is only deducting fees to which <coughs> AMP financial planners have a lawful entitlement and is continuing to derive fees from AMP clients that have been invested in uncompetitive platforms, despite the fact that AMP, NMMT and the two licensees know that these two platforms are not competitive on cost. It is open to the Commissioner to find that the internal systems of AMP and the two advice licensees that govern the relationship between the licensees and the platform operators has contributed to this conduct that falls below community standards and expectations and is insufficient to address the challenges that vertical integration presents to the best interest duty. Vertical integration of platform operators with advice licensees raises a potential conflict between the interests of clients and the interests of the financial services entity that owns both the platform operators and the advice licensees. It is open to the Commissioner to find that the interests of the client would be best served by the client only being invested in a platform in investment through the platform is necessary to meet the client's financial needs and objectives. If it is appropriate for a client to be invested through a platform, then the client's needs and objectives would be best served by being invested through whichever is the most appropriate platform, regardless of manufacturer. However, authorised representatives and employees of advice licensees are typically limited to being able to recommend products on the approved products and services list unless the representative or employee seeks special dispensation. An approved product list approved independently of a licensee's parent entity would not be expected to be limited solely or primarily to platforms operated by one of the subsidiaries of the parent company. On its face, this suggests that advice licensees using such lists that are limited or primarily limited to platforms operated by their related companies are creating a systemic risk of planners failing to act in the best interests of their clients. The potential conflict is further exacerbated with respect to clients that have already invested through a particular platform. In those cases, the risk to the client is that the platform is not kept cost competitive, but the client remains on the platform and the client suffers financial detriment as a result. It is unsurprising that a client would not leave a platform on his or her own initiative. The client has been invested in the platform on the advice of a financial advisor. Clients are unlikely to be comparing the cost competitiveness of platforms. They are therefore in a position in which inertia makes them vulnerable to exploitation. If there was a separation between platform operators and advice licensees, then it would be expected that the advice licensee 
acting on behalf of and in the interests of the licensee's clients might place pressure on the platform operators to charge competitive fees and offer competitive features. The advice licensees would have an informational advantage based on their knowledge of the market and the bargaining power over the platform operators of being able to threaten to move clients to other platforms. On its face, there is a risk that vertical integration of platform operators with advice licensees has reduced competitive tension that would have advantaged clients and impeded the independence of the advice licensee who ought to be acting in the best interests of the client. The limited benchmarking and guidance provided by, provided, by, provided by AMP to its advice licensees has not been sufficient to overcome challenges presented by ownership by AMP of both the advice licensees and the platform operators. It is also unclear why a platform operator ought receive and keep a rebate from a fund manager based on the value of funds invested by the clients in one of the fund manager's funds. If there is to be a rebate, then it might be expected that in a competitive market with vertical separation of advice licensee from platform operator, the licensee would place pressure on the platform operator to pass on any rebate to the clients whose funds are the basis for the rebate. For these grandfathered arrangements relied upon by AMP, the platform operator appears to give nothing for the fees or rebates that it receives from the funds manager. We turn now to CBA and platform <coughs> fees. The Commission heard evidence from the manager of Colonial First State. Ms Elkins has, since August 2012, had direct responsibility for two platform providers Colonial First State Investments and Avantios Investments. Ms Elkins' evidence raised two further issues connected with the role and obligations of platform operators and the appropriateness of platform operators within vertically integrated <coughs> financial institutions. The first is the reasonableness and appropriateness of fee structures based on the amount of funds under management. The second is whether platform operators should satisfy themselves that third-party fees, such as advisor service fees charged under an ongoing service arrangement with a financial advisor, are properly payable before deducting those funds from the client's investment. As to the first question, Ms Elkins' evidence was that across the two platforms offered by Colonial First State, at least two fees are commonly charged an administration fee and an investment fee. The administration fee relates to the provision of service to investors that utilise the platform. The investment fee includes, but may not be limited to, the underlying fund manager's fee. Ms Elkins did not seek to justify the method of charging investment fees and administration fees based on the amount of funds under management. Her evidence was that there was no direct relationship between the amount of funds under management for an individual and either of those fees. She pointed out that such a method of charging was the long-standing industry practice. Ms Elkins acknowledged that one reason the investment fee is a rate in excess of the fund manager's fee is to price in the risk of a miscalculation of the unit price. <coughs> by Colonial First State. In addition to those two fees, investors placed into a platform by a financial advisor who have agreed to an ongoing arrangement with the financial advisor may and often will have the advisor's fee deducted from their investment. In that respect, the platform operator facilitates the payment of ongoing service fees and provides a ready means of regular payment to financial advisors. That may of itself act as an incentive for financial advisors to place their clients into managed investments by way of a platform in preference to direct investment in a managed fund or investment in other asset classes. In that sense, 
while financial advisers are prohibited from receiving conflicted remuneration from product manufacturers, there remains a strong incentive to prefer the use of platforms. That incentive is perhaps increased in circumstances where the platform operator takes no steps to ascertain whether the fee is properly payable. Ms Elkin's evidence was that, col that Colonial First State takes no steps to ascertain whether advisers have complied with their statutory obligations in sections 962G to K of the Corporations Act to provide annual fee disclosure statements to ongoing clients and renewal or opt-in notices every two years. Ms Elkin's evidence also was that Colonial First State takes no steps to obtain confirmation from financial advisers that they have complied with their contractual obligations to provide ongoing service. Ms Elkins did, however, point to Colonial First State's dealer terms of trade, which impose a requirement for licensees with access to platforms to adhere to various legal obligations, including those arising from the Corporations Act. Ms Elkins could not point to any occasion on which those provisions of the dealer terms of trade had been enforced. Given that, like Colonial First State, many platform operators share an ultimate owner with one or more licensees, the probability of any contractual term being enforced as against a related licensee might be thought to be very low. Ms Elkins conceded in her evidence that it would be unlikely that Colonial would deny a CBA-owned licensee access to their platform because of a breach of the dealer terms of trade. Once the centrality of platform operators to the practical operation of many ongoing service fee arrangements is recognised, a question arises as to whether those operators should take steps to ensure that funds deducted from client accounts are properly owing. It is open to the Commissioner to find that Colonial First State may have breached its obligation under section 912A, 1AA of the Corporations Act to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that may arise in relation to the provision of financial services. It is open to the Commissioner to find that Colonial First State preferred its own interests and those of its related entities, CBA's advice licensees, to the interests of those invested in products via its platforms. It has relied exclusively upon its dealer terms of trade to manage those conflicts. Those terms have not been enforced and are not practically enforceable given the vertically integrated environment in which Colonial First State operates. It is also open to the Commission to find that the conduct of Colonial First State fell below the standards expected by the community. Colonial First State facilitated the deduction of fees from client investment accounts in circumstances where those fees were not in fact owing. It has taken no steps to put in place systems that would allow it to ascertain, or at least have a high degree of comfort, that the fees deducted are in fact owing. We have already made some observations about the governance practices of the industry in relation to platforms in connection with the AMP case study. The Colonial First State case study pointed to the same type of conflicts in connection with the vertically integrated model of many institutions which manufacture platforms, manufacture products accessible via platforms and own advice licensees whose authorised representatives recommend that clients invest in those products through those platforms. In light of both the AMP and CBA case studies in relation to platform fees, the following questions are raised for all parties given leave to appear to address. Vertical integration of platform operators with advice licensees serve the interests of clients. If so, how? Why should a platform operator continue to receive a fee or rebate from a fund manager calculated by reference to the value of client funds invested in the fund if that fee or rebate is not wholly passed on to the clients whose funds are the basis for the fee or rebate? 
If platform operators continue to automatically deduct advice fees from clients' investments, why should the platform operator not be required to have controls in place to ensure that Subdivision B of Division 3 of Part 7.7A of the Corporations Act has been complied with? Put another way, why should platform operators not be expected to ascertain that there is a that there is a lawful entitlement on the part of fee recipients to the monies that the operators automatically pay to the fee recipients at the expense of clients. The third topic that was examined in these hearings was inappropriate advice, and the fourth topic was improper conduct by financial advisers. We will deal with these topics together because they raise some similar issues in relation to the monitoring and supervision of financial advisers. The first case study concerned Westpac's financial advice business and the conduct of two employed financial advisers, Mr Mahadevan and Mr Smith. Two witnesses gave evidence, Mrs Jacqueline McDowell, who received financial advice from Mr Mahadevan in 2015, <coughs> and Mr Michael Wright, who is the national head of Westpac's financial advice business, BT Financial Advice. The Commission heard evidence that Mrs McDowell approached Westpac in 2015, seeking financial advice about her retirement strategy. Mrs McDowell was referred to Mr Mahadevan, a senior financial planner within BT Financial Group. The Commission heard that Mr and Mrs McDowell told Mr Mahadevan that they wanted to purchase a property so that they could operate a bed and breakfast in their retirement. They had a number of debts, including a mortgage over their home, and the only money they had available to contribute to the purchase of the property was their combined superannuation balance of around $200,000. <coughs> Mr and Mrs McDowell told Mr Mahadevan that they wanted to establish a self-managed superannuation fund and use the fund to take out a loan to buy a property to run the bed and breakfast. They said that they expected the property would cost around $1 million. Mr Mahadevan introduced Mr and Mrs McDowell to Mr Carl Sleeman, a business banker, who told them that they could borrow enough money to achieve their goal. Following this meeting, Mr Mahadevan told Mr and Mrs McDowell to put their home on the market, which they did. A couple of months later, Mr Mahadevan provided Mr and Mrs McDowell with a statement of, statement of advice. He recommended that they establish a self-managed superannuation fund, roll over their existing superannuation balances into that fund, and each take out life insurance and income protection insurance at a level that would cover the debt they expected to incur to purchase the bed and breakfast property. He did not provide Mr and Mrs McDowell with advice about whether their strategy was viable. Mr and Mrs McDowell authorised Mr Mahadevan to implement the advice. They sold their house in the expectation that they would soon purchase and move into their bed and breakfast property. They moved into short-term rental accommodation and used the proceeds of the sale to pay off a number of their debts. However, as the Commission heard, Mr and Mrs McDowell's retirement strategy was never viable. While preparing to purchase the bed and breakfast property, Mr and Mrs McDowell were told by Mr Sleeman that they could not borrow enough to buy such a property. The Commission heard evidence that a power planner had warned Mr Mahadevan that he should advise Mr and Mrs McDowell to delay establishing the self-managed superannuation fund and taking out new insurance until after a suitable property had been found, but that Mr Mahadevan overrode the power planner. Westpac received $17,600 in upfront commissions as a result of the implementation of the advice, and this contributed to Mr Mahadevan receiving a monthly bonus following the implementation of the advice. Mr and Mrs McDowell made a complaint to Westpac about Mr Mahadevan's advice. Westpac made offers to settle the complaint in early 2017 
but Mr and Mrs McDowell rejected these offers. In March 2016, uh, Mr and Mrs McDowell made a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service. Almost 18 months later, in August 2017, the Financial Ombudsman Service determined the complaint in Mr and Mrs McDowell's favour, requiring Westpac to pay them $107,475. Although the Westpac employee who investigated Mrs McDowell's complaint formed the view in December 2015 that Mr Mahadevan had put Mr and Mrs McDowell in a worse off position, and Westpac made offers to settle the complaint in early 2016. Westpac did not discipline Mr Mahadevan until October 2017, more than 18 months later. Westpac did not report Mr Mahadevan's conduct to a professional association or to ASIC. The Commission also heard evidence about the conduct of Mr Andrew Smith. Mr Smith was a senior financial planner employed by Westpac. Mr Wright gave evidence about Westpac's consequence management policy and how that policy had been applied to Mr Smith. Under that policy, financial advisers at Westpac begin with a total of 60 points and have points deducted for non-compliant activities, such as poor audit results. The number of points that an advisor has determines the advisor's risk rating, which in turn determines the level of supervision to which the advisor is subject and whether the advisor receives a monthly bonus. Between 2011 and 2015, Mr Smith was subject to a number of audits and had points deducted as a result of poor ratings on a number of those audits. However, until 2015, the number of points that were deducted was never high enough for Mr Smith to be ineligible for a monthly bonus or for Mr Smith to be subject to injun. This was in part because these audits were held more than six months apart and points deducted were restored every six months. Mr Wright agreed that Westpac's monitoring and supervision failed in relation to Mr Smith. In 2015, Mr Smith's poor audit results caused him to be identified as extremely high risk. Westpac then conducted an investigation into Mr Smith's conduct. Following that investigation, Westpac put a series of allegations of misconduct to Mr Smith and he resigned. Westpac continued to investigate Mr Smith. It later found that he had recommended strategies or investments that were too risky for customers, transacted without customers' authority, charged ongoing advice fees without providing the promised services and provided inappropriate advice to customers. Westpac has since paid $1.6 million in remediation to 32 former clients of Mr Smith and has provisioned a further $600,000 to remediate a further 59 former clients. Although Westpac made allegations of misconduct against Mr Smith that could have resulted in his termination, it did not report Mr Smith to ASIC as a serious compliance concern. Westpac did not file a significant breach notification with ASIC until November 2015, several months after the reports of its investigations into Mr Smith. Mr Wright did not know if Westpac reported Ms. Mr Smith's conduct to any professional association. When Mr Smith's new licensee, Dover Financial Services, asked Westpac for information about Mr Smith's conduct, Westpac did not provide any information, except to state that there was an ongoing investigation and Westpac had concerns about Mr Smith's conduct. Mr Wright was not aware of Westpac ever communicating the results of its investigations to Dover. If that's a convenient time, Commissioner. Are we travelling for time, is all? Uh, we will conclude today. I'm not sure how much within today we'll conclude, but we will conclude today, Commissioner. <laughs> this day, like all days, will end, yes. is all. Uh, 2 p.m.
Yes, Ms. Oh. Commissioner, I was dealing with the Westpac inappropriate advice case study and the evidence of Mr Wright. Mr Wright also gave evidence about the way in which Westpac remunerates its financial advisers. Mr Mahadevan and Mr Smith were both entitled to participate in an incentive scheme that rewarded financial advisers with a monthly bonus calculated as a percentage of the revenue that they generated above a target threshold. Mr Wright gave evidence of his view that one of the reasons Mr Smith gave inappropriate advice was for the purpose of maximising his share of revenue under that scheme. Mr Wright also gave evidence about Westpac's financial advice business more generally. This evidence included an acknowledgement that the current remuneration framework at Westpac, with its emphasis on revenue measures, could place the interests of customers at risk. Mr Wright gave evidence about some recent reports concerning Westpac's financial advice business. One of those reports identified issues with Westpac's policies, including that policies were not supported by practical guidance to enable advisers to understand what was required of them. Mr Wright accepted that Westpac is very poor at showing its advisers how to comply with its policies. In addition, a report prepared in January this year identified that there are still significant weaknesses in Westpac's consequence management system. The Commission also heard evidence that despite the changes that Westpac has made to its risk and compliance system since 2015, the residual risk of adverse consequences resulting from the provision of inappropriate advice to Westpac customers has remained high and the likelihood of those consequences has increased in recent years from possible to likely, that is between 50 and 85 per cent. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Mahadevan's conduct in connection with the advice that he gave to Mr and Mrs McDowell might amount to misconduct. Westpac conceded so much in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Mahadevan may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B1 of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of Mr and Mrs McDowell in relation to the advice. Mr Mahadevan may also have breached his obligation under section 961G of the Corporations Act only to provide advice to Mr and Mrs McDowell if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to them. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that aspects of Mr Smith's conduct in connection to the advice that he gave whilst employed with Westpac might amount to misconduct. Again, Westpac conceded so much in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Smith may have breached his statutory obligation under 961B1 of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of certain clients. Mr Smith may also have breached his statutory obligation under section 961G of the Corporations Act only to provide advice to certain clients if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to the clients. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Westpac's conduct in the period when Mr Mahadevan and Mr Smith provided the advice that was the subject of this case study might amount to misconduct in the following ways. First, Westpac may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1 of the Corporations Act to do all things to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, Westpac may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1CA of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr Mahadevan and Mr Smith complied with the financial services laws. Third, Westpac may have breached its statutory obligation under section 961L of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr Mahadevan and Mr Smith complied with sections 961B and G of the Corporations Act. 
Fourth, Westpac may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912D to report a significant breach to ASIC within 10 business days after becoming aware of the breach in relation to the conduct of Mr Smith. In connection with the first three of these four available findings, we note in particular that at the relevant time, Westpac's variable remuneration scheme for financial advisors directly incentivised the generation of revenue. Westpac's consequence management system failed to identify advisors who presented a high risk to clients, meaning that those advisors did not face disciplinary consequences or receive increased monitoring and supervision. Westpac's advisors were able to circumvent the recommendations <coughs> of power planners and Westpac had not instituted many of the changes to its systems and processes that it now claims have reduced the likelihood that customers will receive inappropriate advice. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by Westpac that fell below community standards and expectations. <coughs> First, Having identified that Mr Mahadevan provided advice to Mr and Mrs McDowell that left him, them in a worse off position, Westpac made inadequate offers of compensation, resulting in Mr and Mrs McDowell needing to make a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service to attain appropriate re redress. And Westpac did not impose any disciplinary consequences on Mr Mahadevan until almost two years after Mrs McDowell made her complaint. Second, having identified Mr Smith uh, as having received consistently poor audit ratings and as having breached a number of internal Westpac policies and also having made serious allegations of misconduct against Mr Smith, Westpac failed to report Mr Smith to ASIC in response to a notice given by ASIC under section 912C of the Corporations Act in July 2015 and failed to provide adequate information about those matters to Dover Financial Services, Mr Smith's new licensee. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Westpac's misconduct in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice by financial advisers can be attributed, at least in part, to Westpac's remuneration practices. Over the whole of the period covered by this case study, Westpac had a system of remuneration for employed financial advisors that incentivised revenue generation and created a risk that customers would not be provided with financial advice that was in their best interests. Under that system, financial advisers received a percentage share of the revenue they generated above particular thresholds, um, which increased as higher thresholds were met. This created an incentive for financial advisers to recommend strategies and products which increased the revenue earned by Westpac and therefore increased the potential share of revenue earned by the advisor. While advisers are disqualified from participating in the scheme if they fail certain compliance measures, until at least 2017, those compliance measures were inadequate to prevent even high risk advisers like Mr Smith from receiving a share of revenue. Although Westpac has announced plans to shift to a new variable remuneration model for financial advisers, the new system will not commence operation until October this year. Further, the variable re remuneration model will continue to have a component, 20%, that directly rewards the generation of revenue by employed financial advisers. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that Westpac's misconduct in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice by financial advisers can be attributed, at least in part, to the inadequacy of Westpac's consequence management system. Until at least April 2017, this system operated in a way that failed to ensure that advisers who failed to follow Westpac's policies and procedures or failed to comply with financial services laws were subject to increased monitoring and supervision and appropriate disciplinary processes including ineligibility to receive variable remuneration. 
<coughs> Westpac relied too heavily on a system of demerit points to identify financial advisers who represented compliance concerns and failed to structure that system in a way that would bring such advisers to the attention of management. This meant that even where Westpac's monitoring activities, such as compliance audits, identified advisers who represented a risk to customers, <coughs> nothing was done to reduce the risk. The evidence supports a finding that Westpac did not adequately respond to the detriment suffered by Mr and Mrs McDowell. As we've already noted, having identified that Mr Mahadevan provided advice that left them in a worse off position, Westpac made inadequate offers of compensation and did not impose disciplinary consequences on Mr Mahadevan in a timely fashion. Westpac is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions which arise from this case study. First, do remuneration and incentive policies that reward financial advisers for revenue generated for a licensee or employer create an unacceptable risk that financial advisers will prioritise the generation of revenue over the licensee's obligation to provide financial services in a manner that is efficient, fair and honest, over their own obligation to act in the best interests of the customer, and over their own obligation to prioritise the interests of the customer above their own interests and the interests of the licensee. Second, how can financial services licensees best incentivise the provision of good quality financial <coughs> advice, including in situations where the best advice for a customer is not to change anything at all? And third, how can financial services licensees best ensure that the results of routine compliance measures, such as compliance audits, are appropriately escalated so that potential risks to customers are identified and managed in a timely manner. Can I just come back and try to uh, create a framework of, of thought or reference for the moment? Step one, I think, uh, may be uh, identification and examination of the content uh, of the relevant norms of behaviour. If I stop there, uh, I observe you refer to a number of uh, provisions of the relevant Act. Yes. Uh, notably the uh, 912A, 1A, uh, obligation of, uh, and I can never get the triplet right, uh, fair, honest, efficient, uh, I always misorder that, and uh, 961L uh, uh, coupled with G, uh, or uh, 961B rather, capital with coupled with 961G, so best interest, yes. duty, appropriate advice. Yes. So level one, norms of behaviour, uh, is the first area of inquiry. Uh, are they appropriate? Are they sufficient? Now, as I understand it, uh, as far as your address has been permitted to go, uh, before rude interruption, uh, you've said nothing suggesting that the norms of behaviour require modification? No, we have not, Commissioner. Step two, then, in the analysis is questions of structure, structure of the industry. Uh, is there any set of questions about structure? You have referred to some issues that you can draw together in uh, the perhaps opaque uh, expression of vertical integration. Uh, 
there are at least three elements uh, at play, I think. There are uh, product manufacture, uh, product sale, uh, advice, and the way in which those three elements uh, either fit together or don't fit together, uh, according to uh, both existing firm structures uh, and according to uh, some uh, view of what is appropriate. Below that you then have, I think, uh, a division between what I, I would tend to call internal measures and external measures. Internal measures, uh, it seems to me you mention questions of remuneration uh, and its associated issue generally of culture, uh, rewarding good conduct, penalising bad conduct and all of that suite of issues. Monitoring uh, internally to detect departure from what is seen as desirable. Then consequence management, what happens when you have detected departure. Uh, and then, so far as the client is concerned, issues of remediation, to which we will perhaps come in due time. And then associated with those internal measures, but in a sense standing apart from them, is external uh, uh, measures which can be wrapped up as ensuring compliance uh, and enforcing uh, compliance with the uh, norms of behaviour. But is that an available structure for getting thoughts into uh, some sort of order? It certainly is, Commissioner. Um, and there are some themes within... Because, because if it's not uh, the, the best form of approach to this, then I need the parties to tell me. Uh, no, don't think of it, of it in according to that uh, order of uh, uh, or, or structure. Think of it according to this form of structure. But somewhere, somehow, I've got to get my head around uh, how best to pull thoughts together. There are questions that we will pose, Commissioner, in relation to vertical integration and structural separation of product and advice, which we had in mind posing by reference to the statements that we had tended dealing with vertical integration. They may assist on these topics then as well. you're ahead of me. I doubt that, Go Commissioner. On. <laughs> uh, the, um, the second case study uh, in relation to inappropriate advice concerned ANZ's financial advice business and the conduct of two financial advisers, Mr John Doyle, who was an authorised representative of RI Advice Group, a subsidiary of ANZ, and Mr Christopher Harris, who was an authorised representative of Millennium Three Financial Services, another subsidiary of ANZ. The fifth case study also related to ANZ and concerned the conduct of Mr A, a financial advisor who was an authorised representative of Millennium Three. Uh, in the second case study, the Commission heard evidence from Mr Darren Werrett, the General Manager Aligned Licensees and Advice Standards, and Ms Kylie Rickson, the Chief Risk Officer for Digital and Wealth Australia. As the Commission heard, ANZ, ANZ provides financial advice services through four entities, ANZ Financial Planning and three aligned dealer group entities owned by ANZ, RI Advice Group, Millennium Three and Financial Services Partners. Mr Werrett gave evidence that he's responsible for the supervision and monitoring of the activities of ANZ's aligned dealer group entities and he also supervises the advice review which determines whether clients have suffered financial detriment as a result of financial detriment as a result of misconduct engaged in by an ANZ advisor and the compensation to be paid to such clients. Mr Werrett gave evidence about the two financial advisors, the subject of the case study. The first of those was Mr John Doyle. 
Mr Doyle entered, entered into an authorised representative agreement with RI Advice Group in May 2013. RI had actively sought to recruit Mr Doyle and other financial advisers who were authorised representatives of another licensee, Australian Financial Services. These advisers were offered financial incentives, including upfront payments, to move to RI. Despite warnings from ASIC about the need for enhanced due diligence <coughs> in relation to former Australian financial services advisers and a customer complaint uh, RI received about Mr Doyle in August 2013, no enhanced monitoring or supervision of Mr Doyle was applied after he commenced with RI. Mr Doyle's files were not audited until nearly two years after he commenced in February 2015. Despite Mr Doyle selecting the files to be audited, contrary to the standard file selection process, Mr Doyle failed the audit, receiving the worst possible rating. Issues identified with Mr Doyle's advice included recommendation of products not included on RI's approved product list, which RI had deemed inappropriate due to their complexity. Mr Doyle's poor audit results were so significant that they skewed the audit results across the RI business. However, the only step RI took as a result of the audit was to require Mr Doyle to submit all of his advice documents to a vetting officer for review prior to the advice being provided to the clients. There was a further targeted audit of Mr Doyle's files in May 2015. The results of this audit were worse than the February 2015 audit. Again, an issue identified was the recommendation of products not on RI's approved product list. Following this audit, Mr Doyle recommended that a number of his clients invest in Macquarie Flexi 100 structured products. These products were not on RI's approved product list at the time Mr Doyle recommended them because of the degree of complexity and risk associated with the products. ANZ later found that these products were not appropriate for the clients Mr Doyle recommended them to. Mr Whereat terminated the authorised representative <coughs> status of Mr Doyle and his company, Carrington Corporation, in June 2015. The termination was expressed to be effective six months later. Another audit a month later identified further issues and Mr Doyle was then suspended but was permitted to continue providing advice to approximately 700 existing clients until March 2016. At the time of Mr Whereat's evidence, RI had not yet completed its review and remediation of Mr Doyle's clients. Mr Whereat acknowledged that it was unacceptable that it has taken two to three years to remediate clients found to have been given inappropriate advice. The second advisor about whom Mr Whereat gave evidence was Mr Christopher Harris. In July 2013, an audit was conducted on Mr Harris's files in which he received the lowest available score. As a result of the audit, Mr Harris was required to submit advice for pre-vetting. Mr Harris's conduct was discussed at consequence <coughs> management committee meetings in 2013 and 14. In July 2014, Mr Harris passed an audit and in August 2014, the consequence management committee decided to close the incident in relation to Mr Harris. Mr Harris wasn't audited again until July 2015. The Commission heard about advice Mr Harris gave to two clients in the period between the July 14 and July 15 audits. The first of these clients was an elderly widow who received advice from Mr Harris in April 2015 in relation to the investment of a $32,000 term deposit. Mr Harris's advice was to invest in a wrap account the result of which was that the client incurred high upfront and ongoing costs with no distinguishable benefits. The second client was advised to roll her superannuation into a new account in order to save approximately $238 a year. Mr Harris charged $3,330 for this advice and signed the client up 
to a $3,790 ongoing service fee. Mr Werrett agreed that the advice given to both of these clients was inappropriate. Mr Werrett also gave evidence that during this period a customer made a complaint about Mr Harris, questioning the fee she'd been charged and claiming the advice she received did not meet her needs. Following this complaint, a state development manager met with Mr Harris. She expressed concerns after this meeting about the risk that Mr Harris posed to Millennium 3 and about his attitude to compliance, and she noted that she had raised these concerns previously. These concerns were forwarded to the CEO and the Chief Operating Officer of Millennium 3. Despite the recommendation of the State Development Manager that the authority of Mr Harris be terminated, Millennium 3 instead decided to issue Mr Harris with a letter of censure, which imposed certain requirements on Mr Harris, including pre-vetting of advice. In February 2016, further concerns were raised about Mr Harris's practices, including a failure to provide ongoing services for which clients were paying fees. Millennium 3 attempted to access Mr Harris's files but were unable to do so for over a year. The Commission heard that despite being on Millennium 3's watch list for two to three years, receiving the lowest scores on at least two audits and the serious concerns raised by the State Development Manager, Mr Harris was permitted to continue providing advice to clients during the 13 months that Millennium 3 was attempting to access his files. There were a number of meetings at which Mr Harris was discussed in late 2016 and early 2017. <coughs> the report of a targeted review, which had been requested in November 2016, was not provided until April 2017. It identified a list of issues with Mr Harris including the provision of inappropriate advice and advice outside authorisation. Millennium 3 decided to terminate Mr Harris's status as an authorised representative in April 2017. In July 2017, Millennium 3 sent a letter to ASIC about Mr Harris's conduct, but did not identify this as a significant breach under Section 912D of the Corporations Act. As at the time of Mr Werrett's evidence, none of Mr Harris's clients had been remediated for inappropriate advice or for having been charged fees without receiving services. The Commission also heard that Mr Harris is still providing financial services on behalf of Dover and that Millennium 3 did not mention the matters raised in this case study to Dover in response to a request by Dover for information about Mr Harris. The Commission also heard evidence about ANZ's financial advice business more generally from Ms Rickson. Ms Rickson had oversight of the risk and compliance of the advice business within ANZ, including ANZ Financial Planning and the aligned dealer groups. Ms Nixon gave evidence about the remuneration and incentives that apply to advisers employed by ANZ Financial Planning. Until this year, the calculation of bonuses for advisors included a component determined by the revenue that the financial advisor generated. Leaderboards were also published which ranked advisors on various criteria, including amount of revenue generated. Ms Rickson accepted that this reflected a culture of emphasising the growth of <coughs> business more than the best interests of the client. The Commission also heard that the calculation of bonuses for management within the advice business still includes a revenue component, as does the calculation of bonuses for advisers in ANZ's aligned dealer groups. In the fifth case study, the Commission heard evidence from Mr Kieran Ford, the Head of Wealth Solutions and Partnerships at ANZ. Mr Ford gave evidence about Mr A, who became an authorised representative of Millennium 3 in 2009. Mr A was not permitted to provide advice to customers to invest in particular pro properties. Mr A contacted a number of his clients in his capacity as an authorised representative of Millennium 3 in relation to a potential property investment. 
Mr A informed the clients that although the initial price of the property was over $2 million, he had negotiated a lower purchase price and believed the property could be sold at a profit. He told the clients that he required $600,000 from investors for the deposit and stamp duty. Mr A convinced five of his clients to invest through managed superannuation funds. Four invested $100,000 and the fifth $200,000. The clients believed that they were subscribing for units in a unit trust that would acquire the property. However, Mr A acquired the property in the name of a company of which he was the sole director of the unit trust. The Commission heard evidence about audits of Mr A's practice, of Mr. A's practice prior to these <coughs> events. In February 2011, Millennium 3 audited five of Mr A's files, each of which was rated as very poor advice, the lowest possible rating. Mr A did not face any disciplinary consequences as a result of these results. In November 2011, four files were rated very poor advice and the fifth was rated poor advice. Again, Mr A did not face any disciplinary consequences through these audit results. The only step Millennium 3 took was to require Mr A to pre-vet his advice before providing it to clients. In 2012, after a further poor audit, Mr A's status as an authorised representative was terminated. Despite the poor audit results and the termination of Mr A's status, Millennium 3 did not investigate Mr A's other client files to determine whether any of his clients had been given inappropriate advice. In September 2013, one of the clients who had invested $100,000 in the purchase of the property sent a complaint to Millennium 3 about Mr A, noting that they had lost the $100,000. In December 2013 and January 2014, Millennium 3 identified the four other self-managed superannuation funds that were listed as unit holders in the unit trust and were the clients of Mr A's when he was an authorised representative of Millennium 3. Millennium 3 and ANZ did not attempt to contact those clients or to investigate whether they had suffered any loss but instead left it to those clients to come forward and prove that they had suffered loss. Mr Ford said this had occurred because Millennium 3 had prioritised its commercial interests uh, ahead of the interests of its clients. Neither ANZ nor Millennium 3 had access to Mr A's files, which Mr Ford accepted would have made it very difficult to determine whether any of Mr A's clients had suffered loss. In 2016 and 17, further complaints were made by former clients of Mr A uh, relating to unauthorised withdrawals from self-managed super funds and investments in the unit trust. And in August 2017, ANZ appointed McGrath Nicol to conduct an investigation into Mr A's conduct. Following re receipt of their report, ANZ decided to have its advice review team review the advice given by Mr A to 103 customers during his time as an authorised representative of Millennium 3. ANZ has not yet determined how many customers were affected by Mr A's conduct as they are still reviewing the files. ANZ has notified the West Australian Police of allegations made by three of Mr A's clients that he withdrew funds totalling $234,590 from their accounts between March 2011 and February 2012 without their authority. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find, I deal with each of the advisers in turn, that Mr Doyle's conduct in connection with the advice he gave to clients to invest in the Macquarie Flexi 100 line of products might amount to misconduct. ANZ conceded as much in its evidence. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that in giving advice to his clients, Mr Doyle may have breached his statutory obligation under section 946A1 of the Corporations Act to give certain clients a statement of advice. Mr Doyle may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B 
of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of certain clients, and Mr Doyle may have breached his statutory obligation under 961G of the Corporations Act to only provide advice to certain clients if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to the client. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Harris's conduct in connection with the advice he gave to the clients in the statements of advice that are exhibits DJW 115 and DJW 120 to Mr Werrett's statement may have amounted to misconduct. Again, ANZ conceded so much in its evidence. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that in giving that advice to his clients, Mr Harris may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B to act in the best interests of certain clients and breached his statutory obligation under 961G to only provide advice to certain clients if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to them. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr A's conduct in connection with the advice that he gave to clients to invest in the unit trust to fund the purchase of the property may also have amounted to misconduct. Again, ANZ conceded so much in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr A may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B to act in the best interests of those clients, his obligation under section 1041G1 of the Corporations Act not to engage in dishonest in relation to a financial product or financial service, his obligation under section 1041H of the Corporations Act not to engage in conduct in relation to a financial product or financial service that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. Uh, and Mr A may also have breached his statutory obligation under section 12DA of the ASIC Act not to engage in conduct in relation to financial services that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of RI Advice Group in the period when Mr Doyle provided the advice that was the subject of this case study might also amount to conduct in the following ways. First, RI Advice Group may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1A of the Corporations Act to do all things to ensure that the financial services <coughs> covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, RI may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1CA of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr Doyle complied with the financial services laws. Third, RI may have breached its statutory obligations under section 961L of the Corporations Act to ensure that representatives such as Mr Doyle complied with sections 961B and 962G of the Corporations Act. RI Advice Group finally may have breached its statutory obligation under section 952H of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr Doyle complied with their obligations under part 7.7 .7 of the Corporations Act to give clients a statement of advice. In connection with these available findings, we note in particular that RI Advice Group recruited Mr Doyle from a licensee that had been the subject of regulatory action by ASIC. RI allowed Mr Doyle to provide advice in circumstances where he had failed a competency test at the start of his time with RI Advice Group. RI failed to audit Mr Doyle for two years after he commenced and after Mr Doyle received poor audit results, RI failed to stop him from providing advice to clients as its contractual documents required it to do. RI instead placed Mr Doyle on pre-vetting in circumstances where it knew that this was an ineffective control that could be circumvented and it was in fact circumvented by Mr Doyle. And at the relevant time RI and ANZ had not instituted many of the changes to its systems and processes 
that they now claim have reduced the likelihood that customers will receive inappropriate advice. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Millennium 3's conduct in relation to the period when Mr Harris and Mr A provided the advice that was the subject of these case studies might also amount to misconduct in the following ways. Millennium 3 may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1A of the Corporations Act to do all things to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Its statutory obligation under section 912A1CA to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with the financial services laws. Its statutory obligation under section 912A1D of the Corporations Act to have available adequate resources to carry out supervisory arrangements. Its statutory obligation under section 912A1H of the Corporations Act to have adequate risk management systems. And in respect of the period after October 2016, Millennium 3 may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912G of the Corporations Act, set out in ASIC class order CO 14 of 923 to ensure that it kept client records in such a way that they were accessible to Millennium 3 at all times in a way that enabled Millennium 3 to produce the records. In connection with these available findings, we note in particular that Millennium 3 allowed Mr Harris to continue to provide advice to clients for several years after it identified that he had not been complying with financial services laws. Millennium 3 failed to have in place arrangements to ensure that it could access and review Mr Harris or Mr A's client files. It twice placed Mr Harris on pre-vetting in circumstances where it knew that it was an ineffective control that could be circumvented. And despite warnings from Mr Harris's supervisors over a considerable period of time, Millennium 3 consistently failed to take adequate steps to terminate Mr Harris's authorised representative status. On the evidence, it is also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by RI Advice Group that fell below community <coughs> standards and expectations. First, RI Advice Group failed to take adequate steps to protect customers of Mr Doyle from receiving inappropriate advice after it had repeatedly identified issues with his advice. Second, RI has delayed in implementing a review and remediation program in that the majority of Mr Doyle's client's files have not yet been reviewed over two years since RI decided to terminate Mr Doyle's status. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by Millennium 3 that fell below community standards and expectations. First, Millennium 3 failed to take adequate steps to protect customers of Mr Harris from receiving inappropriate advice after it had repeatedly identified issues with his advice. Second, Millennium 3 has delayed in implementing a review and remediation program with no client of Mr Harris yet being compensated for losses caused as a result of Mr Harris's advice. Third, having terminated Mr A in circumstances where he had received extremely poor audit results, Millennium 3 took no steps to investigate whether any of his clients had suffered detriment <coughs> as a result of his advice. And finally, after identifying specific clients of Mr A who may have suffered loss because of Mr A's conduct, <coughs> Millennium 3 took no steps to contact those clients or investigate whether they had suffered detriment as a result of Mr A's advice. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that RI Advice Group and Millennium 3's conduct in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice by financial advisers can be attributed, at least in part, to the inadequacy of their risk management systems. Ms Rickson gave evidence that since January 2014, the residual risk of adverse consequences resulting from customers of ANZ and its aligned dealer groups receiving inappropriate financial advice has remained high. 
for a period of more than four years, covering the whole of the period in which Mr Doyle and Mr Harris provided the advice that was the subject of the second case study, ANZ's Risk Management Committee continued to accept that high risk, they continued to accept that risk and to approve risk treatment plans that did not reduce that risk below its high level. These continuing high levels of risk were at least in part the result of underinvestment by ANZ in the systems and processes necessary to improve its control environment and ensure that customers of ANZ, RI and Millennium 3 were receiving appropriate advice. In November 2016, more than two years after ANZ first approved a risk treatment plan in relation to the risk of adverse consequences resulting from the provision of inappropriate financial advice, an internal audit report noted that a quantum shift in investment was required to enable the aligned dealer groups to meet regulatory expectations, to deliver on <laughs> customer remediation programs and improve the control environment. On the evidence, it is also open to find that RI advice group's conduct in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice can be attributed, at least in part, to the inadequacy of RI's recruitment processes. In around March and April 2013, shortly prior to the date on which the FOFA conflicted remuneration reforms were to become mandatory, ANZ and RI Advice Group decided to actively approach a number of financial advisers who were authorised representatives of Australian Financial Services. The targeted advisers were selected because they held $677 million in funds under management in products issued by an entity associated with ANZ, which ANZ wished to retain. The targeted advisers included Mr Doyle, who had $60 million in funds under management in that product. The advisers were offered financial incentives, including upfront payments, to move to RI. The Commission also heard evidence that ANZ and RI were aware at the time they pursued these advisers that ASIC had imposed additional licence conditions on Australian financial services as a result of advisor misconduct. ASIC contacted ANZ to express concerns about the recruitment of these advisers and RI assured ASIC that it would only onboard advisers who met enhanced due diligence standards. Mr Doyle entered into the authorised representative agreement with RI in May 2013 and one element of the increased due diligence standards to be applied by RI to former Australian financial services advisers was that competency and knowledge tests were to be administered prior to agreements with advisers being issued. Mr Doyle completed a test on 15 July 2013, a couple of months after he commenced. He <coughs> failed the test and was assessed as not yet competent. Despite the results of this test, the warnings from ASIC about former Australian financial services advisers and the customer complaint that RI had received in August 2013, no enhanced monitoring or supervision of Mr Doyle was applied. <coughs> On the evidence, it is open to find that RI and Millennium 3's conduct in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice can be attributed, at least in part, to the inadequacy of their internal systems. First, RI and Millennium 3 allowed high-risk advisers to continue to provide advice to customers subject to a requirement that the advice could be pre-vetted in circumstances where they knew that pre-vetting could be circumvented and was ineffective as a control. Second, because of the complex internal structure for decision-making about consequence management, Millennium 3 delayed in imposing consequences on advisers who were identified as being a high risk to customers. Third, RI and Millennium 3 did not take adequate steps to ensure that their authorised representatives kept client files in a way that would enable them to be easily re reviewed to identify whether inappropriate advice had been provided. At no stage was it mandatory for authorised representatives of Millennium 3 to store client files electronically 
in X plan. An audit of advice provided by ANZ financial advisers between 2013 and 2015 found that as many as one in five files sampled did not contain adequate file notes and records to enable verification of the quality of the advice. The evidence also supports a finding that RI and Millennium 3 did not effectively and adequately respond to the potential detriment suffered by customers of Mr Doyle, Mr Harris and Mr A. In the case of Mr Doyle, RI assigned the review and remediation of his customers a low priority in circumstances where it had not yet taken adequate steps to determine whether Mr Doyle's customers had suffered detriment. As a result, the files of the majority of Mr Doyle's customers have not yet been reviewed over two years after an internal investigation identified a risk that Mr Doyle's clients had suffered detriment as a result of his advice. In the case of Mr Harris, despite audit reports over a period of several years indicating serious deficiencies, it was not until March 2017 that Millennium 3 undertook a targeted review of Mr Harris's files. That review identified the potential for client detriment in almost all of the files reviewed, but ANZ's remediation program in respect of Mr Harris's clients remains in the scoping and investigation stage over a year later. In the case of Mr A, as we have noted, having terminated Mr A in circumstances where he had received extremely poor audit results, Millennium 3 took no steps to investigate whether any of his clients had suffered detriment as a result of his advice. And even after identifying specific clients of Mr A who may have suffered loss, Millennium 3 took no steps to contact those clients or investigate whether they had suffered detriment. RI Advice Group and Millennium 3 are invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open, as well as any other findings they regard as available. Um, all parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions that arise from this case study. First, is it possible for financial services licensees to adequately monitor the quality of advice provided by employees and authorised representatives where that advice is provided in a manual environment? Second, are improvements in technology the only way to ensure that financial advisers provide quality advice? Third, how should financial services licensees ensure that customers of their authorised representatives are adequately protected while the licensee investigates the conduct of the authorised representative? <coughs> and fourth, taking into account that it may never be possible to reduce the risk to zero, what is an acceptable level of risk that customers will be provided with inappropriate advice? and associated with the acceptable level of risk must be also uh, a connection with uh, identification and uh, investigation and remediation. Uh, it may be that uh, uh, all of those elements and perhaps others as well need to uh, be considered as a whole rather than distinctly. But again, let's hear what the parties have to say about that. <clears throat> the third case study in relation to inappropriate advice, Commissioner, concerned AMP's financial advice business and the conduct of three authorised representatives, Mr E, who was an authorised representative of AMP Financial Planning, a subsidiary of AMP, Ms Jennifer Coleman, an authorised representative of Charter Financial Planning, also a subsidiary of AMP, and Mr Adam Palmer, an authorised representative of Genesis Wealth Advisors, which was a subsidiary of AMP at the relevant time. <coughs> One witness gave evidence in this case study, 
Sarah Britt, Head of Compliance at AMP Limited. The Commission heard that in November 2016, Mr E provided advice to a married couple who was seeking advice to improve the performance of their superannuation funds to meet their long-term goal of accumulating more wealth. Mr E recommended that the married couple roll over their superannuation benefits from their existing funds, which were not owned by AMP, into My North Super, a fund owned by AMP. The effect of that advice was that the husband sacrificed approximately $16,000, close to 25% of the balance of the fund, on the transfer to My North Super. Ms Britt conceded that in making this recommendation, there was no attempt by Mr E to compare the husband's likely returns if he were to remain in his current funds with the likely returns from moving to My North Super. The wife was also charged a higher ongoing fee as a result of her rollover. Ms Britt conceded that Mr E's evidence was, I'm sorry, that Mr E's advice was inappropriate. Mr E was first audited by AMP Financial Planning in September 2016, about two months before giving the advice to the married couple. He received a C rating for that audit. Although the audit revealed deficiencies in Mr E's advice of the same kind as the advice that he ultimately provided to the married couple, the remedial action that followed the audit did not prevent Mr E from continuing to provide inappropriate advice. Mr E was audited again in March 2017 and this time received an E rating. Following this audit, Mr E failed to comply with the required remedial actions. Subsequently, it was recommended that Mr E's personal authorisation be revoked and the agreement with AMP Financial Planning be terminated immediately. However, AMP did not support the recommendation to terminate the advisor. Ms Britt conceded that there was certainly some discomfort around that decision. AMP Financial Planning has been aware of Mr E's misconduct for over 12 months, since March 2017. Despite this, as at the date Ms Britt gave evidence, AMP Financial Planning had not yet remediated the married couple for, or even contacted them regarding, the inappropriate advice. The second authorised representative whose conduct was the subject of this case study was Ms Coleman. In February 2016, Ms Coleman gave financial advice to a de facto couple. The couple had recently had a child and they were seeking insurance advice to ensure that their family would be secure in the event anything happened to either parent. Ms Coleman recommended that the male client replace each of his existing insurances with the recommended insurance which was said to be cheaper by just less than $1,000 per annum. However, Ms Coleman misled the clients in the following ways. First, by misquoting the insurance premiums, which were higher than the amount stated in her advice. Second, by not disclosing that the premiums were going to be paid out of the couple's superannuation funds. Third, by not disclosing the exit fees that applied to the client's superannuation funds. And fourth, by failing to disclose that she may receive an activation payment in respect of one of the products that she recommended. Ms Britt conceded that Ms Coleman got it wrong and accepted that the clients had been misled by Ms <coughs> Coleman about the amount of money it would cost to replace their existing insurance policies with the ones recommended by Ms Coleman. The Commission heard evidence that on 6 June 2016, Ms Coleman was audited. She received a D rating and this was Ms Coleman's third consecutive D rating. Following this rating, the issues panel determined to revoke Ms Coleman's authorisation. Ms Coleman's corporate authority was terminated in June 2016 and Ms Coleman resigned from Charter in July 2016. On the 6th of July 2016, the matter of Ms Coleman was passed to the AMP Review and Remediation Program for review. That was almost two years ago. The Commission heard evidence that Ms Coleman's clients have not yet received compensation for or even been contacted by AMP about the inappropriate advice they received from Ms Coleman. 
Ms Britt agreed that if the insurance policies were renewable annually, that by now the couple would have missed their opportunity to elect not to renew the policies. Ms Britt also agreed that if the policies were being renewed annually, it would be better for the clients to know about the inappropriate advice they had received now so that they may be able to make decisions about whether or not to renew. The third authorised representative whose con conduct was the subject of this case study was Adam Palmer. Mr Palmer became an authorised representative of Genesis in May 2013. Ms Britt accepted that the interview and appointment process of Genesis conducted with respect to Mr Palmer was deficient. Despite the fact that Genesis was aware of issues at the time Mr Palmer commenced as an authorised representative of Genesis, Mr Palmer was not required to submit any files for vetting until February 2014, approximately 10 months after he started. There was no audit of his files until July 2014, over 12 months after he started. Mr Palmer received an E rating for that July 2014 audit, the lowest possible rating. One of the files the subject of the audit disclosed that Mr Palmer had given advice to a couple who were wanting to renovate their home to establish a self-managed super fund and roll over their super into the self-managed super fund and purchase an investment property. There were a number of problems with this advice identified by the audit, including that there was no evidence of any assessment of the couple's risk tolerance. The advice fell outside the scope of Mr Palmer's accreditations as he did not have self-managed super fund or gearing accreditations. And Mr Palmer was providing advice that could be deemed property advice. The audit also identified that Mr Palmer had a conflict of interest. Mr Palmer had a direct interest, a 60% ownership, in a property business which acted as a buyer's advocate and to which he referred clients to assist with the purchase of properties. Ms Britt accepted that Mr Palmer's conduct was dishonest. Ms Britt also agreed that Mr Palmer's case was an example <coughs> where had Genesis followed adequate procedures at the time or immediately after Mr Palmer was made an authorised representative, it would have rung alarm bells. Following the audit in July 2014, Mr Palmer's matter went to the AMP issues panel and a decision was made to terminate Mr Palmer. However, Mr Palmer resigned before he was terminated. In October 2014, Mr Palmer moved to Dover Financial Advisors. ASIC conducted a review of Mr Palmer's files at Dover and identified multiple breaches of the Corporations Act in connection with those files. In October 2014, a breach assessment was prepared in respect of Mr Palmer. It was determined that his conduct did not constitute a breach reportable under Section 912D of the Corporations Act and AMP did not resolve to report his conduct as a serious compliance concern. Ms Britt accepted that the decision not to report the conduct as a serious compliance concern was a decision she would not make today based on everything she has seen, particularly as he was later notified to ASIC on this basis. AMP did not report Mr Palmer's conduct to ASIC until July 2015, 12 months after the audit, in response to a request by ASIC for information. Ms Britt accepted that Genesis failed to provide adequate training regarding the best interest duty and related obligations. Since terminating Mr Palmer's authorisation in September 2014, no client has received remediation for inappropriate advice given by Mr Palmer. Although AMP has commenced its review of Mr Palmer's files, a number are still yet to be received and Ms Britt could not provide a date for when the assessment of those files will be complete. Ms Britt's evidence was that AMP has not made any specific provision for compensation for any of Mr Palmer's clients. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find firstly that Mr E's conduct in connection with the advice that he gave to the married couple might amount to misconduct. AMP conceded this in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it's open to the Commissioner to find 
that Mr E may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B to act in the best interests of his clients. He may have breached his statutory obligation under 961G to only provide advice if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to the clients. And in relation to Ms Coleman, on the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Ms Coleman's conduct in connection with the advice that she provided to the de facto couple might also amount to misconduct. Again, AMP conceded this in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Ms Coleman may have breached her statutory obligation under section 961B of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of her clients, <coughs> her obligation under 961G of the Corporations Act to only provide advice if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate, and her obligation under 961J of the Corporations Act to give priority to her clients' interests in circumstances where, in recommending a product for which she may have received an activation payment, there was a conflict of interest between her interests and the client's interests. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Palmer's conduct in advising clients to open self-managed superannuation funds and purchase investment properties with the assistance of a business in which he had a direct interest might also amount to misconduct. Again, AMP conceded this in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Palmer may have breached his statutory obligation under section 961B of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of the clients, his obligation under 961G to only provide advice to clients if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to the client, his obligation under 961J uh, by failing to give priority to the client's interests when giving advice in circumstances where, by reason of his 60 per cent interest in the property business, there was a conflict between his interests and the interests of the clients. He may have breached his obligation under 1041H1 of the Corporations Act not to engage in conduct in relation to a financial product or financial service that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive, and he may have breached his obligation under section 12DA of the ASIC Act not to engage in conduct in relation to financial services that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that AMP financial planning's conduct in the period when Mr E provided the advice that was the subject of this case study might amount to misconduct in the following ways. First, AMP Financial Planning may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1A to do all things to ensure that financial services covered by its licence were by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, AMP Financial Planning may have breached its obligation under section 912A1CA of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr E complied with financial services laws. Third, AMP Financial Planning may have breached its obligation under section 912A1H of the Corporations Act to have adequate risk management systems. And fourth, AMP Financial Planning may have breached its obligation under section 961L of the Corporations Act to ensure that Mr E complied with sections 961B and 961H of the Corporations Act. In connection with the first three of these available findings, we note in particular that at the relevant time, AMP Financial Planning failed to ensure that its audit standards were such that Mr E's conduct could be detected and remediated at the earliest opportunity. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Charter's conduct in the period when Ms Coleman provided the advice that was the subject of this case study might also amount to misconduct in the following ways. First, Charter may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1A 
to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, Charter may have breached its obligation under section 912A1CA to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Ms Coleman complied with financial services laws. Third, uh, Charter may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1H to have adequate risk management systems. And fourth, Charter may have breached its statutory obligation under section 961L to ensure that Ms Coleman complied with sections 961B, 961G and 961J of the Corporations Act. In connection with the first three of these available findings, we note in particular that at the relevant time, Charter failed to ensure that its audit standards were such that Ms Coleman's conduct could be detected and remediated at the earliest opportunity. In relation to Genesis, on the evidence it's open to the Commissioner to find that Genesis, Genesis's conduct in the period when Mr Palmer provided the advice that was the subject of this case study might amount to misconduct in the following ways. First, Genesis may have breached its obligation under section 912A1A to do all things to ensure the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, uh, Genesis may have breached its obligation under 912A1CA of the Corporations Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that representatives such as Mr Palmer complied with financial services laws. Third, Genesis may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1F to ensure that its representatives were adequately trained and competent to provide services. Fourth, Genesis may have breached its obligation under 912A1H to have adequate risk management systems. And fifth, Genesis may have breached its obligation under section 961L to ensure that Mr Palmer complied with section 961B, section 961G and section 961J of the Corporations Act. In connection with the first four of these available <coughs> findings, we note in particular that at the relevant time, Genesis failed to ensure that the process of assessment of its authorised representatives prior to them commencing with Genesis was such that Mr Palmer's conduct could be detected and remediated at the earliest opportunity. Genesis failed to ensure that its audit processes were such that Mr Palmer's conduct could be detected and remediated at the earliest opportunity. And Genesis did not take any steps to ensure that Mr Palmer had the necessary qualification, requalification, or to prevent him providing advice for which he was not qualified to give until after the audit. <coughs> On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of conduct by AMP Financial Planning, Charter and Genesis that fell below community standards and expectations. First, despite having been aware of Mr E's conduct for more than 12 months, AMP Financial Planning have still not remediated the married couple or even contacted them about the inappropriate advice they received. Second, despite the advice given by Ms Coleman to the de facto couple having been passed to the AMP Review and Remediation Program almost two years ago, Charter has not yet contacted those clients or remediated them for the inappropriate advice they received from Ms Coleman. Third, Despite having terminated Mr Palmer's authorisation in September 2014, AMP has not yet completed reviewing his client files or made any specific provision for compensation for any of his clients. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of Genesis in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice by Mr Palmer can be attributed, at least in part, to a culture of emphasising the growth of the business over ensuring that advisers are appropriately qualified. Mr Palmer had a significant and valuable client base that he was willing to transfer to Genesis. The evidence supports a finding that in order to obtain this client base, 
Genesis failed to take adequate steps to ensure that Mr Palmer was appropriately qualified to provide all of the kinds of advice that he intended to provide. In July 2014, AMP detected that there was no record of Mr Palmer having completed either an external self-managed super fund accreditation or the AMP in-house introduction. However, no steps were taken at this time by AMP to prevent Mr Palmer from providing advice regarding self-managed super funds. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of Genesis in connection with the provision of inappropriate advice by Mr Palmer can be attributed, at least in part, to Genesis, Genesis's recruitment processes. Mr Palmer became an authorised representative in May 2013, having been an authorised representative of Australian Financial Services, the same licensee as Mr Doyle in the ANZ case study. As we've already noted, ASIC had imposed restrictions on this licensee's licence in 2011 as a result of misconduct by its advisers. Ms Britt accepted that the interview and appointment process of Genesis conducted with respect to Mr Palmer was deficient. Mr Palmer had disclosed that he did not hold the relevant qualifications for the services he was to carry out. He did not provide a copy of his previous, previous audit or the audit rating achieved. Um, and despite all of this, the interviewer recommended that Mr Palmer proceed to application stage. In Mr Palmer's authorised representative application form, in respect of the areas of advice that Mr Palmer wished to appear on his financial services guide, Mr Palmer ticked most areas, including self-managed super funds. The form required that specialist qualification accompany the application for this area of advice. However, Mr Palmer did not provide any specialist qualifications. He did not list any financial planning industry qualifications on the application form either. Uh, despite the fact that Genesis was aware of these issues at the time Mr Palmer commenced, Mr Palmer was not required to submit any files for vetting until February 2014 and there was no audit of his files until July 2014, over 12 months after he started with Genesis. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of AMP's licensees is attributable, at least in part, to the inadequacy of the audit processes within those licensees. Ms Britt gave evidence that audits are AMP's principal method by which it detects inappropriate advice and it ensures that it is not given. A review conducted by PwC in November 2017 of AMP's advice control framework identified two high priority areas of improvement. These related to file audits and vetting. In particular, PwC expressed concerns about inconsistencies between the audit scores reached by the AMP auditor and the audit scores reached by PwC. PwC's conclusion was that the approach was very sensitive and the difference between an A, B and C result could be quite subjective. In PwC's words, a small discrepancy in interpretation could lead to a vastly different audit outcome. The evidence also supports a finding that AMP and its licensees did not adequately respond to the detriment suffered by the clients of the advisers considered in the case study. As we've already noted, AMP and its licensees have failed to remediate the clients of any of those advisers. Ms Britt gave evidence that the remediation program of AMP was moving very slowly. Ms Britt attributed this to the size and scale of the remediation program at AMP and the complexity of some of the remediation issues. Ms Britt was able to say that AMP had completed the remediation of 14 advisor books but was unable to give any specific information about how many further clients were in the pool yet to be remediated or contacted about the possible inappropriate <laughs> advice they had received. Essentially, as Ms Britt put it, AMP has underestimated the size of the task. 
AMP Financial Planning, Charter and Genesis are invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as open, as well as any other findings that they regard as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions which arise from this case study. First, what is an acceptable period of time after identifying that a client has been or may have been provided with inappropriate financial advice to inform the client of that fact? Second, what is an acceptable period of time after identifying that a client has been or may have been provided with inappropriate financial advice to remediate the client for any losses suffered? Commissioner, I would move next to the NAB case study, but I wonder if the, commission, the Commissioner might allow us a very brief break before we move to that case study. Yes, of course. Uh, if I come back, what, at 25, a uh, little after 25 past? Yes, thank like you, that. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the fourth case study concerned the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms by financial advisers at NAB. One witness gave evidence in this case study, Mr Andrew Hagger, the Chief Customer Officer in the Consumer Banking and Wealth Management Division at NAB. Mr Hagger gave evidence that the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms by financial advisers at NAB was first identified as an issue in connection with the conduct of a particular financial advisor, Mr Bradley Main. In 2016, Mr Main met with two customers who agreed that Mr Main would provide them with advice in relation to their superannuation and insurance. Mr Main presented the customers with a statement of advice including a recommendation to reduce their level of life insurance cover and switch to paying the premiums for that cover through their superannuation. The customers completed insurance application forms. In those forms, they chose to make non-lapsing binding death benefit nominations, each nominating the other as the beneficiary under the life insurance policy. However, the customers did not fill in the space in the form identifying the portion of the benefit that the other should receive, and although the form required that the customer's signatures on the binding nomination be witnessed by two people, only Mr Main witnessed the customer's signatures. Subsequently, Mr Main's client service officer noticed that the forms had not been witnessed by the required second witness. Even though the client service officer was not present at the time the customers signed the forms, Mr Main asked her to witness their signatures, which she did. She also noticed that the customers had not completed the percentage of benefit in relation to their nominations. Mr Main completed this figure himself and initialled incorrect client details on both forms. Mr Hagger gave evidence that the failure to comply with the witnessing requirements for a non-lapsing binding death nomination created the potential for the beneficiary nomination form to be invalid and opened up the possibility that the trustee would allocate funds differently to the wishes expressed by the client. The following month, during a routine compliance check of Mr Main's files, a regional wealth executive noticed an irregularity in the initialling on the forms. Mr Main admitted to initialling the forms himself and to asking the client service officer to witness the forms even though she was not present when they were signed. NAB suspended Mr Main and then terminated his employment. A couple of months later, in January 2017, NAB's breach review committee considered Mr Main's conduct. It determined that his conduct did not fit the serious compliance concern criteria and it did not report him to ASIC at this time. Mr Hagger gave evidence that he thought this decision was wrong. NAB also did not report Mr Main's conduct to any professional association. Between February and May 2017, NAB identified other financial advisers who had been involved in incorrectly witnessing beneficiary nomination forms. 
On the 23rd of May 2017, a memo was prepared for the Breach Review Committee. The memo recorded that NAB employees believed that incorrect witnessing of the forms was common practice and that employees did not understand the seriousness of their actions. Mr Hagger gave evidence that the incorrect witnessing of the forms had become a social norm within NAB. He accepted that this behaviour was evidence of a failure of discipline and a failure of culture at NAB. On the 31st of May 2017, NAB's Breach Review Committee decided that the incorrect witnessing of the forms represented a significant breach and was therefore reportable to ASIC. On the 5th of June, about six months after it had terminated Mr Main's employment, NAB included Mr Main in a list that it gave to ASIC about advisers with compliance concerns. Mr Hagger gave evidence that NAB made a wrong judgment in not reporting <coughs> Mr Main's conduct to ASIC earlier. On the 15th of June 2017, NAB lodged a significant breach notification with ASIC <coughs> in relation to the issue of inv invalid binding nomination witnessing on the basis that NAB had breached its obligations under section 912A1A and 1041H of the Corporations Act. By this time, NAB had identified 325 staff who were involved in incorrectly witnessing beneficiary nomination forms, 200 of, 204 of whom were financial advisers employed by NAB. In March this year, NAB provided a further update to ASIC about this matter. By that time, NAB had identified that 2,520 clients were affected by invalid binding nomination witnessing. Mr Hagger gave evidence about the steps that NAB has taken to ensure that the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms does not affect clients' estate planning wishes. He also gave evidence about the consequences that have been imposed on financial advisers and their managers at NAB as a result of this conduct. Financial advisers who self-reported, having been involved in incorrect witnessing, received an irreversible amber conduct gate, which <coughs> reduced their short-term incentive payment by 25%. Depending on their level of seniority, Managers in NAB's financial advice business, including Mr Hagger, received between a 10 and 100 per cent reduction in their short-term incentive payment as a result of the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms and other issues in the wealth division. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Main's conduct in connection with the advice that he gave to the two customers in 2016 might have amounted to misconduct. NAB acknowledged as much in its evidence. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Main may have breached his statutory obligation under section 1041H of the Corporations Act not to engage in conduct in relation to a financial product or financial service that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. Uh, Mr Main may have also breached his statutory obligation under section 12DA of the ASIC Act not to engage in conduct in relation to financial services that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to find that NAB's conduct in connection with the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms might have amounted to misconduct. Um, NAB acknowledged so much in its submissions and evidence. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that NAB may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1A of the Corporations Act to do all things to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly, and NAB may have breached its statutory obligation under section 912A1CA to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with the financial <coughs> services laws. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct was attributable to the broader culture of the financial advice business within NAB. 
Although the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms was first identified in connection with one adviser, it later became clear that the practice of incorrectly witnessing such forms was widespread in NAB's financial advice business. Many employees explained that they engaged in the practice of incorrectly witnessing the forms or asked others to do so because they believed it was common practice. That so many employees would be willing to sign a formal document attesting to a particular fact that they had witnessed a customer's signature when that fact was not true indicates a lack of understanding of and respect for ethical and legal obligations within NAB's financial planning business. This in turn reflects a culture which appears to have prioritised the convenience of financial advisers and customers above ethical and legal obligations. The Commission heard that in November 2015, NAB had commissioned a review into conflicts of interest uh, between 360 Research and its internal stakeholders and within NAB. The reviewer found that there was a widespread absence of knowledge of NAB's code of conduct and expected behaviour standards. Mr Hagger gave evidence that he was not provided with this report in 2015 and had only recently become aware of its existence. NAB recognised that the widespread incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms within its financial advice business was attributable to the internal culture of the financial advice business and took steps to impose financial consequences for the leaders of the business who were responsible for that culture. NAB is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions which arise from this case study. First, how should financial services balance the need to ensure that employees are held responsible for misconduct against the risk that punishing poor behaviour will encourage employees to conceal that behaviour? Second, how should financial services licensees recognise and reward ethical conduct by financial advisers? Third, are there particular characteristics of the financial advice industry that lead to there being a higher incidence of improper, unethical or dishonest conduct than in other industries? If so, what should be done to address that issue? Well, it, it would be not only uh, what is to be done, but what are those characteristics, I think. What are those characteristics yes. uh, and what do you do about them? The fifth topic that was examined in these hearings, Commissioner, was the disciplinary processes in the financial advice industry. The first case study on this topic concerned Ms Donna McKenna and the financial advice she received from Henderson Maxwell. Three witnesses gave evidence in this case study, Ms McKenna, Mr Henderson, the Chief Executive Officer of Henderson Maxwell, and Mr Dante DeGori, the Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Planning Association of Australia. The Commission heard that in late 2016, Ms McKenna approached Henderson Maxwell for financial advice after seeing Mr Henderson on television. Ms McKenna told Mr Henderson that she was seeking advice about her superannuation contributions <coughs> ahead of the changes in taxation laws that were to take effect on 1 July 2017. She also sought advice about potentially buying an investment property. In November 2016, Ms McKenna met with Mr Henderson and provided him with details about her financial situation including details about her state authority's superannuation scheme, her SAS account. At that meeting, Mr Henderson asked Ms McKenna whether she would be interested in establishing a self-managed superannuation fund. Ms McKenna gave evidence that she initially told Mr Henderson 
that she had no interest in establishing such a fund, but Mr Henderson persisted in promoting the benefits of self-managed super funds. Following the meeting, one of Mr Henderson's employees telephoned Ms McKenna's superannuation fund to confirm the details of her accounts. The Commission heard an audio recording of that conversation in which Mr Henderson's employee impersonated Ms McKenna while speaking with SAS. The SAS representative explained that if Ms McKenna were to access the funds in her SAS account earlier than age 58, she would be entitled to about $500,000 less than if she were to wait until age 58 and be permanently retired. The Commission heard that Mr Henderson's employee impersonated Ms McKenna in several other telephone calls to the superannuation fund. The Commission heard that Mr Henderson did not conduct any other research into superannuation funds for Ms McKenna and did not conduct any research into whether managed accounts other than the Henderson Maxwell managed account might be more suitable in Ms McKenna's particular circumstances. In December 2016, Mr Henderson presented Ms McKenna with a statement of advice. Mr Henderson recommended that Ms McKenna establish a self-managed superannuation fund, roll over her superannuation into the fund and set up a Henderson Maxwell managed account. Had Ms McKenna implemented this advice, she would immediately have forfeited her entitlement to around $500,000 in her SAS account. For this advice, Mr Henderson charged a plan preparation fee of $4,950. Had the plan been implemented, he would have charged an establishment fee to set up the Henderson Maxwell managed account of $1,980, brokerage fees of $4,105 and an ongoing fee of $14,642 for investment management services. The Commission heard that the fee for investment management services was materially higher than the fees Ms McKenna was paying on her existing superannuation account. Ms McKenna met Mr Henderson again in January 2017. Ms McKenna gave evidence that Mr Henderson accepted that his advice would have caused Ms McKenna to lose about $500,000 but that he claimed it was only a draft and told Ms McKenna she could still implement the advice when she turned 58. Mr Henderson offered Ms McKenna a refund of her advice fees. Ms McKenna made a complaint about Mr Henderson to the FPA. In responding to this complaint, Ms. Mr Henderson described Ms McKenna as aggressive and nitpicking. The Commission also heard that while the complaint was being investigated, Mr Henderson contacted Mr DeGory, the CEO of the FPA, saying that he was very disappointed with the process and the FPA's treatment of members and describing the complaint as a seemingly minor matter. In October 2017, the FPA's investigating officer concluded that Mr Henderson had a case to answer in respect of a number of breaches of the FPA Code of Ethics and Practice Standards. Mr Henderson provided a response to the investigating officer's report. <coughs> Excuse me. Despite asking for them, Ms McKenna was not provided with either of these documents or given an opportunity to be heard in connection with the disciplinary proceedings. In November 2017, the FPA commenced disciplinary proceedings against Mr Henderson. Following a negotiation, Mr Henderson agreed to accept a number of findings, including that he had failed to take due care in delivering professional services, failed to consider whether Ms McKenna's current superannuation strategy could have met her objectives, needs and priorities, and failed to identify why the Henderson Maxwell managed account service was suitable for Ms McKenna. Mr Henderson also agreed to a series of sanctions on the basis that the FPA would not publish his name in connection with the disciplinary proceedings. In March this year, that negotiated agreement was submitted to the Conduct Review Commission, the independent disciplinary body connected with the FPA. The chair proposed an additional sanction that Mr Henderson not be permitted to engage in public media appearances for 12 months. 
Mr Henderson asked for some modification to that sanction and later resiled from his previous acceptance of the proposed findings against him. To date, there has still not been a formal resolution to Ms McKenna's complaint in the Conduct Review Commission. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Henderson's conduct in connection with the advice that he gave to Ms McKenna might amount to misconduct. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Mr Henderson may have breached his obligation under section 961B of the Corporations Act to act in the best interests of Ms McKenna, his obligation under section 961G to only provide advice to Ms McKenna if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice was appropriate to her, and his obligation under section 961J to give priority to Ms McKenna's interests over his own interests and the interests of Henderson Maxwell in circumstances where if Ms McKenna had implemented Mr Henderson's advice, Henderson Maxwell stood to earn a significant amount in ongoing investment management fees. On the evidence, it is also open to the Commissioner to find that Henderson Maxwell's <coughs> conduct in connection with the advice that Mr Henderson gave to Ms McKenna might amount to misconduct. In particular, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Henderson Maxwell may have committed an offence under section 952E1 of the Corporations Act by giving a defective financial services guide dated January 2016. On the evidence, it is also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by Mr Henderson and Henderson Maxwell that fell below community standards and expectations. First, Henderson Maxwell is responsible for the conduct of its employees uh, and an employee impersonated Ms McKenna in telephone calls with Ms McKenna's superannuation funds on at least five occasions. Second, Mr Henderson's conduct in response to the complaint made against him to the FPA, including his failure to provide <coughs> adequate assistance to the FPA with its investigation and his personal criticisms of Ms McKenna, fell below community standards and expectations. The second case study in relation to this topic concerned Dover Financial Advisors. The Commission heard evidence from Terence McMaster, the sole owner and one of three responsible managers of Dover Financial Advisors. Dover has in excess of 400 authorised representatives, making it one of the largest licensees in Australia. The examination of Dover's practices and conduct centred around three issues, its internal audit control, its conduct in respect of recruitment of new authorised representatives, and its conduct in dealing with liability to the clients of authorised representatives and complaints made by those clients. Uh, we will focus on two of those aspects, um, conduct in respect of recruitment and conduct in respect of liability to and complaints by clients. In evidence, Mr McMaster was presented with three situations in which Dover had authorised a person to be its representative without first having made contact with the former licensee and in circumstances where matters had been disclosed to Dover that would cause a reasonable licensee acting properly to take further steps before authorising the person. The first relevant authorised representative was Adam Palmer. Mr Palmer first made contact with Dover before 25 September 2014 the day on which he gave notice to Genesis of his intention to move to Dover. Mr Palmer forwarded an email to Dover within a minute of sending an email to Genesis. An inference arises that Mr Palmer had been told before that day that Dover would accept his application. Two weeks later, on the 14th of October 2014, Mr Palmer completed a reference checking form in which he disclosed that his files were the subject of an audit by Genesis. Mr McMaster's evidence was that Mr Palmer had already disclosed to Dover that he was also under investigation for matters connected with direct property investment, which Dover determined would not present a problem provided they were disclosed in Mr Palmer's financial services guide 
and conflict register. Despite Mr Palmer's written and oral disclosures, no reference check was sought from Genesis until 26 December 2014, two months after the date that Mr Palmer was authorised by Dover and three months after Mr Palmer had been told that he would be authorised by Dover. The second relevant authorised representative was Julie Hamilton. Ms Hamilton was advised by Mr McMaster that she could become an authorised representative of Dover within two hours of her advising Mr McMaster that her current licensee, Financial Wisdom, intended to report her to ASIC for a serious breach. Mr McMaster's response uh, was that he was not unduly troubled by this. He then offered for Dover to take Ms Hamilton on as an authorised representative with immediate effect. Ms Hamilton was later banned by ASIC from providing financial services for three years. The third relevant authorised representative was Koresh Horton. Mr Horton had advised Dover that Financial Wisdom had concerns about advice he had provided while an authorised representative. Dover appointed Mr Horton as a representative on the 22nd of January 2015. Dover first contacted Financial Wisdom by letter on the 10th of February 2015. Mr Horton was later permanently banned by ASIC from providing financial advice. Each of those examples demonstrates that while Dover had policies in place in respect to the onboarding of advisers and undertook reference checks, it did not undertake those checks in a timely fashion and undertook the checks because of ASIC's expectations and not because of an interest in the outcome of the checks. We turn to the evidence of Dover's conduct in respect of client complaints. There were three distinct topics that related to that issue. The first was advice given by Mr McMaster to Ms Hamilton by email about a limited indemnity she had offered her former employer. The tenor of the advice was the difficulties faced by clients in obtaining financial redress against a financial advisor. Taken in isolation, that advice may not provoke concern, but when coupled with two other pieces of evidence, it might be thought to take on a different complexion. The second piece of evidence relevant to client complaints was a letter sent by the Financial Ombudsman Service to ASIC in which the Financial Ombudsman Service pointed to potential serious misconduct by Dover in the handling of a consumer complaint and possible systemic issues in Dover's provision of financial services efficiently, honestly and fairly. The letter explained that contrary to FOS's terms of reference, as interpreted by FOS's operational guidelines, Dover had sent a letter to the complainant that outlined that making false complaints about financial advisers can give rise to defamation actions and similar proceedings. The third piece of evidence is Dover's attempt to exclude itself from liability for the conduct of its authorised representatives by the Dover Client Protection Policy. That policy was in place prior to April, to, to April 2018. By the policy, Dover sought to establish contractual exclusions of liability in reliance on section 917D of the Corporations Act. Mr McMaster accepted that Dover's position was to seek to obtain the maximum exclusion possible, even if ultimately some clauses of the client protection policy were found to be unlawful. On this evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Dover might have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, by engaging in misleading and deceptive conduct, contrary to section 1041H of the Corporations Act or section 12DA of the ASIC Act in connection with the Dover Client Protection Policy. Second, contrary to section 912A1C of the Corporations Act, Dover failed to comply with financial services laws, namely section 1041H of the Corporations Act and section 12DA of the ASIC Act by its incorporation of the client protection policy into all contracts between its authorised representatives and their clients. 
Third, Dover breached a recognised and widely adopted benchmark for conduct by including unfair contract terms in the Dover Client Protection Policy, contrary to Section 12BF of the ASIC Act. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that Dover's practices fell below the standards and expectations of the community in the following respects. First, its recruitment practices fell below community standards and expectations uh, as they failed to make adequate inquiries before authorising representatives and by authorising representatives known to be under investigation by prior licensees without first making adequate inquiries. Second, Dover's practices fell below community standards and expectations when Dover alluded to the risk of defamation proceedings in correspondence to the complainant to the dispute submitted to the Financial Ombudsman Service. All parties with leave to appear and Dover, which did not seek leave to appear, are invited to address the following questions. First, are the steps required by the ABA reference checking and information sharing protocol adequate to protect the public when financial advisers transfer between licensees? Second, should licensees be required to maintain a minimum degree of satisfaction as to the competence and integrity of applicants to become authorised representatives before authorising? If so, what form should that requirement take and what minimum levels should be set? In connection with this topic, the Commission heard evidence from witnesses from the FPA, the AFA and from ASIC about the existing disciplinary processes in the financial advice industry. Mr de Gori, the CEO of the FPA, gave evidence about the FPA's disciplinary <coughs> processes and about the FPA's handling of the complaint made by Ms McKenna. The Commission heard that the FPA has the power to impose different types of sanctions, the most serious of which is expulsion from the FPA. However, as there is no requirement for, fi for financial advisers to be members of the FPA, advisers who are expelled may continue to provide financial advice. The Commission also heard that the FPA is required by its constitution to keep all complaints and disciplinary matters concerning its members confidential, unless the matter becomes subject to its publication provisions. In the 18 determinations made by the Conduct Review Commission since 2009, in seven of those cases, the identity of the advisor is confidential. Um, the Commission also saw that in all cases where a matter was summarily disposed of, the FPA kept the identity of the member confidential. The Commission heard that the FPA does not receive formal referrals from ASIC and that the primary way in which it becomes aware of professional conduct issues is through self-declarations by applicants for membership and at membership renewal time. <coughs> Mr Philip Kewen, the Chief Executive Officer of the AFA, told the Commission about the AFA's disciplinary process. The Commission heard that the AFA had an oversight function added to its constitution in 2017 and that the association aims to function as a co-regulator in relation to its members with regulatory authorities and statutory bodies. However, over the last five years, the AFA has had only two complaints referred to its disciplinary committee. The main way in which professional conduct issues of members come to the attention of the AFA is through public announcements made by ASIC. This morning, the Commission also heard evidence from Louise McCauley, the Senior Executive Leader of the Financial Advisors Team at ASIC. Further, in connection with the other topics in this module, the Commission heard evidence about the internal disciplinary processes of Westpac, ANZ, AMP and NAB. The evidence given in relation to the disciplinary processes of ASIC, the FPA, 
the AFA and financial services licensees during this hearing block gives rise to a number of questions relevant to the adequacy of existing laws and policies and industry self-regulation to identify, regulate and address misconduct in the industry. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions. First, are the general obligations set out in section 912A of the Corporations Act expressed at too high a level of generality to be capable of being effectively enforced? What alternative obligations would be more appropriate? Second, is the current division of responsibility for professional discipline of financial advisors between employers, <coughs> ASIC and professional associations operating effectively to ensure that financial advisors face appropriate consequences <coughs> for breaching their statutory and professional obligations? Third, does that division of responsibility create gaps in the disciplinary system? If so, what are they? Fourth, is it possible to implement a single system for professional discipline of financial advisors? Would structural changes to the financial advice industry be required to bring that about? Would a system of licensing at both an individual and an entity level be more appropriate than the existing system of licensing only at the entity level? Fifth, is there a particular regulatory culture that has developed in relation to the regulation of the financial advice industry? What is that culture and what has contributed to its development? And sixth, has the existing regulatory culture in the financial advice industry contributed to the occurrence of misconduct in the financial advice industry? What changes in regulatory culture might assist in reducing the incidence of misconduct in the financial advice industry? Finally, Commissioner, at the start of this hearing block, we tendered a number of statements dealing with the topics of approved product lists, conflicted remuneration and white label products. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions arising from those statements. First, can financial advisers effectively manage the conflicts of interest associated with providing advice as a representative of an institution that also manufactures financial products? Is it necessary to enforce the separation of products and advice? Second, should the statutory carve-outs to the ban on conflicted remuneration including the recently amended carve-out in relation to insurance commissions, be maintained? If so, why? Commissioner, that concludes our closing statement. Thank you very much, Ms Orr. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, I want to return to uh, state more precisely, perhaps, uh, the directions that I will give about uh, the making of written submissions. Uh, there are some uh, variations that, uh, having heard the final submissions of council assisting, I think uh, may be desirable. By 4 p.m. Friday 4 May, uh, the parties to the following case studies may make written submissions not exceeding the length about to be specified about the findings which those parties submit should be made as arising from the relevant case study as follows. <coughs> A, fees for no service, AMP, 30 pages. 
B, fees for no service, CBA, 20 pages. C, platform fees, AMP and CBA, treating them as a single case study, each of AMP and CBA, 20 pages. D, Westpac, uh, arising out of uh, the uh, uh, advisors Mahadevan and Smith, 20 pages uh, in total for the two of them together. Uh, ANZ, uh, arising out of the cases of Doyle Harrison, Mr A, uh, together, 20 pages. AMP arising out of the matters of Mr E, uh, Coleman and Palmer, 20 pages. Uh, NAB uh, arising out of the beneficiary forms, uh, 20 pages. Then in connection with uh, disciplinary issues concerning Henderson, Henderson, Maxwell, McKenna and FPA, uh, the Henderson and Henderson Maxwell interests may have 20 pages and FPA may have 20 pages. Uh, then, as to Dover Financial Advisors, as Ms Orr noted, uh, that entity and those associated with that entity have not yet sought leave to appear. Uh, I should restate and re-emphasise that having regard to the circumstances in which Mr McMaster's evidence came to be cut short, uh, if he were later to seek an opportunity to give further evidence uh, on the matters that were the subject of examination, uh, I would of course consider that application and I should say also that in considering the evidence uh, he has given, uh, a matter that I will have to uh, be conscious of is whether, especially towards the latter part of his examination, uh, I should uh, conclude that he was in a state uh, where he was able to give a uh, proper account uh, of himself uh, there was, I should say, uh, no immediate cause for concern uh, apparent to me. Had there been, I would have stopped the proceedings sooner than I did. Uh, but uh, no doubt I should uh, have regard to the uh, circumstances in which he uh, ceased to give evidence. But in respect of Dover Financial Advisors, uh, it, if it is so advised, uh, and or uh, Mr. Uh, uh, it really is the end of a two-week sitting block, isn't it? His Mr. name McMaster, is just McMaster. Thank you very much. Uh, the name had completely <laughs> blotted from my mind. Uh, should have uh, together a total of twenty pages. That I think. Uh, takes account of the uh, uh, written submissions about uh, uh, specific case studies. And then in addition, by 4 p.m. Monday, 7 May, any party having leave to appear may make such written submissions as it is advised, not exceeding 35 pages on any or all of the general uh, questions or issues raised by senior counsel assisting in the course of her closing submissions. Ms Orr, is there anything arising out of that uh, unduly long direction that I should uh, think about? No, Commissioner. No. Well, uh, may I thank all counsel concerned uh, for their assistance during this block of hearings and adjourn uh, the Commission until the next block of hearings.